Mr. Haji Khan, you can upload introduction of Mr. Raja Mahendran. Aji. Aji, please Aji. upload. Meeting starts now. Aji, over to you. Please start the meeting, Aji. Yeah. Good morning to all. I welcome you all to, for this global webinar on guidelines of disinfection services on uh, common public places, basic module. Today we have uh, six speakers for this session. I request all the participants to mute their video and audio throughout the session so that there is no disturbance for the speakers and other listeners or two. The first speaker will be Mr. Raja Mahindran. Before he starts his session, I just give a small intro to him. Raja Mahindran, international business, uh, pest business consultant, has a passion to transform the pest control industry to become pest risk, pest risk managers. Raja has extensive experience in global marketing and development of pest control products. He has a Master of Science in Agriculture and Entomology from the Postgraduate Institute of Agriculture in Sri Lanka and a Bachelor of Science degree in Biology from the University of Madras in India. Today, Raja serves the global industry based out of Switzerland, Sri Lanka and Australia. Now I request Mr. Raja Mahindran to talk over this session. There is no sound, not at all audible. Greetings and a very good morning, everyone. It's really great to be with you all this morning. It's morning here in Switzerland. It's 7 o'clock, 10.30 in India. Welcome to the usual webinar. We have participants from around the world, from far back as Australia, different countries in Asia. We have people in Europe, in Africa, and the Americas. Depending where you are, a very good morning to you, a very good afternoon, or a very good evening. Welcome all of you to the UPL International Webinar on Guidelines on Disinfectant. The UPL invited me to facilitate uh, this seminar and to give an introductory presentation, and I'm very honored, and it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. As you know, the world has been really shaken, shaken as never before by a tiny virus, the coronavirus. The world has never experienced this kind of happening around the world at the very same time. And at the same time as the coronavirus causing so much damage in trillions of dollars around the world, the virus has also killed thousands of people and infected thousands of people. And in this background, Disinfection service has also exploded around the world in, as a reaction to what's happening around the world with the virus. So this morning we are going to discuss about disinfection services. That is the focus of our meeting. And UPL have taken the initiative to give leadership to this area. So disinfection services do need to be initiated, training. So they have taken this initiative to further educate, to further enhance the knowledge of disinfectants among pest control operators, among authorities, among those involved in food processing in different industries around the world 
So this is a great initiative on the part of UPL. And I'm very thankful to them for having taken this initiative and for having invited me. So as uh, Hanji mentioned, there'll be five different uh, presentations today, uh, five different uh, technical presentations done by six speakers. And each speaker will be introduced by the previous speaker. But before I get into my presentation, I'd like to remind all as well to turn off your video and your audio. The audio, you can see the icons next to the time on the bottom of your screen, but don't turn off your computer audio because then you won't be able to hear at all, but just on this uh, software. So please do that. So if I can have my very first slide, please. So that we can begin. Sir, is it visible for you? No, it's not visible. Introduction only is there. Shall I share my screen from here? One minute, sir. one minute. Is it, is it visible now? Yes, yes, you can make it a presentation mode, please. Yeah. Okay, so the so my presentation this morning is uh, disinfection services, and the objective is to give a basic overview of the disinfection services and to consider some regulatory aspects as well. So if I can move on to the second slide. So in this part of the presentation, what I like to share with you is. What is this infection service? Who does it? When is it usually done? How is it done? And what is the future of disinfection? We all know that this is the why of disinfection service. The why is because we have diseases, and that is why disinfection service is done in order to control these disease microorganisms. And different speakers after me will go into the depth of each of these areas. The purpose of my presentation is to give you an overview, a snapshot of the what, who, when, and how of the disinfection service. If you can move to the next slide, please. So disinfection service can be achieved in uh, two ways, or disinfection for that matter. One way is through heat or thermal remediation, where rooms or chambers can be heated about 60 degrees, for example, and that would kill all the microbes inside. The other is through chemical disinfection, and today we are going to focus on chemical disinfection. All the presenters will be talking about the different aspects of chemical disinfection. And as you know, there are very common disinfectants throughout the world. In some countries, certain disinfectants are more popularly known than in other countries. So I just shared with you some of the global ones. Depends on your country, which one of these is more popular, I don't know. And I'm not referring to any particular brands, but only showing them as different examples. For example, sodium hypochlorite or bleach is very common. There's ethanol or alcohol based uh, disinfectants that are common. There's hydrogen peroxide, for example, or work on. And there's also coordinary ammonium compounds, which are very, very popular around the world. So these are some of the common chemical disinfectants. And we will be looking into the different aspects of how they are used in the disinfection service. And uh, if I can get to the next slide, please. So most of you are familiar with the pest control industry, and I think most of the participants today are from the pest control industry, and some are from the food industry, and some are regulators. But you're very familiar with how the 
pest control industry has evolved in the last so many years. In the 1960s, for example, the pest control industry were mere chemical applicators. They went around spraying chemicals, usually the strongest chemicals, and spraying it everywhere. That was pest control in the 60s. But come the 70s, 80s, the industry evolved to become pest control operators or PCO. And there the pest control operators started to focus on the pests, on the biology of the pests, and started to treat only the areas where pests are found or could be found. So that was a, quite a departure from the chemical applicator mentality. And since then, the industry has evolved to become pest managers and using more high-tech technology, green pest management, integrated pest management, sustainable pest management, non-chemical and so on, and including traps and various forms to complement the chemicals as well. So the industry has evolved a lot, but the disinfectant industry or disinfectant services industry has not evolved in this way. And if I can have the next slide, please. Okay, so as you can see in this, there's been no evolution as such of the disinfection service industry. We are still in the same way as we were 40 or 50 years ago, a very much chemical focus, very much a chemical applicator. The only thing that has changed is today we are wearing PPE, personal protection equipment. That's a big difference. Otherwise, we are doing it the same way, spraying chemicals everywhere, as you can see in that second modern picture, just almost washing the streets, washing the buildings. That is disinfection service even today with disinfectants. And this has to become more strategic, more precise, and we will discuss those issues. So in the past, the disinfection industry was very much focused only on health facilities like hospitals, pharma plants, food establishments. And only when there was an epidemic, when there was SARS or MERS, the disinfection service kicked into the public areas. Otherwise, it was very much confined only to health, food, and epidemic situation. How is the market today? Today in the market, we see a huge explosion in the use of disinfectants. And professional pest control operators who are facing this lockdown and limitations of business suddenly found an explosion of business and business opportunities, which is excellent. So more and more hospitality industries like hotels, restaurants are needing disinfection, commercial establishments, particularly offices, factories, schools, universities in the educational area, rural, even in animal housing. All this is taken off in a very big way. But it's faced with challenges today. There's a shortage of PPE, as you know. There's a lack of training. People haven't been trained to do this kind of large scale disinfection services. So there's a lack of training and a need for training at the moment. And that is why UPL has taken this initiative to begin this process of training. And also there's no monitoring equipment. Like when you go into a building, how do you know there is virus or there's bacteria? And after the treatment, how do you know there's been a reduction? So that kind of monitoring devices are lacking in the business. So therefore the, the pest managers or whoever is carrying out the disinfection services are going and spraying everywhere or misting everywhere, mainly for the reason we are not able to see because these are micro. So this is an area which I think UPL is also working on and developing uh, monitoring equipment so that it will facilitate the better and more effective use of uh, disinfectants. So how about in the future? The future we see a market growth and for this there has to be better professionalism, better training, uh, digital and high-tech kind of products have to come in. There has to be an SOP standards. SOP standards are lacking in this industry, in the disinfection service. And of course, more strategic applications. So once you can detect, once you're able to see if you can, if there's some kind of a device that you can actually wear and see, then you can be more precise in your application of uh, microbes. So these are some of the developments we see coming in the future. We can have the next slide. So what is disinfection service? Let's define this. So disinfection service is the surface treatment. It's a surface treatment of hard surfaces against microbes. The surface treatment and hard surfaces against microbes. And these are areas frequently in contact by humans and animals, frequently touched by humans and animals. These are the areas to really focus on treating 
And there are different ways of uh, disinfection service treatments that are carried out. There's spraying, of course, as you can see on your left hand side of the screen, spraying is the most common way and one of the most effective ways of uh, controlling various microbes. There's also the misting because there are some areas you don't want to wet, like your car, for example, or expensive uh, couches, sofa, and so on. You use misting in such situations, which you see in the center. And also you would wipe. There are certain common areas or frequently touched areas like door handles, for example, which you can spray a disinfectant and wipe them. There are also wipes with strong disinfectants, which you can use to wipe the door handles as well. So the key to success in this disinfection service is that you use the correct disinfection, of course, but you have to also make sure it's used only on hard surfaces and the hard surface is thoroughly made thoroughly wet. The contact time has to be there. There has to be also the right concentration. You can't just mix up disinfectants as you please. You have to use it according to the label as to how they've recommended it should be diluted. And the contact time too is very, very critical. If you're exposed to for a too short a time, the disinfection service may not work. The disinfectant will not work. So when you're spraying like porous surfaces, like concrete, for example, you have to spray a bit more to keep the surface wet because only while the surface is wet that the disinfectant keeps killing. Once the disinfectant dries, it's no longer destroying virus or bacteria or anything like that. So this is very, very critical to remember what kind of uh, surface you're treating as well. If we can move to the next slide, please. So what is not disinfection service? I mean, a lot of people are carrying out disinfection service the right way, some not right, right way, and some are actually doing it the wrong way. For example, in Asia in particular, in a lot of Southeast Asian countries, South Asian countries, there's been an explosion of what are called disinfection tunnels or disinfection chambers where sodium hypochlorite or ethanol is sprayed onto people. This is the wrong way of doing it. You can see that picture on the left of the screen. There's a picture in the middle of the screen showing even bikes going through and made. So all they're doing is giving a bath of uh, disinfectants uh, to the people and nothing is really achieved. Because as I mentioned before, disinfectants are to treat hard surfaces. They're not intended to treat human beings. So they will not work in this way. And just going through it for 20 seconds or 30 seconds is not going to achieve anything except giving these people a bath with chemicals. These are actually pesticides. So giving them pesticide baths and sending them through these tunnels and chambers that are not going to work. You can see a quotation below there from the head of the Malaysian Health Authority there. He said spraying an individual with chemicals for 30 seconds was not enough to effectively disinfect the person. Chemicals used in such equipment could be harmful to the eyes and mouth from my assessment. There's no proof at all. That's what he says. But a lot of Southeast Asian countries, South Asian countries are still doing this. I saw India has now banned it, but in countries like Sri Lanka, it's still going on. And you can see a picture on your extreme right which is also from Sri Lanka, where people are actually sprayed with the disinfectants. And these are all wrong ways of doing disinfection. And these are not disinfection service. These are giving people a bath of chemicals, which are of no use because not going to kill the virus this way. Okay, if we can get to the next slide, please. So disinfection service, how does it differ? Sometimes it's very confusing. You hear about cleansers, you hear about disinfectants, you hear about sanitizers, then you also hear about sterilizers, cleaning, disinfecting, sanitizing, sterilizing. So what is the big difference among these words? Are they all the same or are they actually different? So you can see the picture on the top left, which is an example of cleaning. Cleaning is simply removing dirt. So using soap and water and mopping, that is cleaning. And in the process, sure, it may have some effect on some bacteria, but that is cleaning. So what is sanitizing? If you go to the picture on the left or the bottom, that is sanitizing where you actually use a sanitizer, which is a chemical, to mix and treat the flow, for example, and it will actually reduce the bacteria and the virus. It will not eliminate, but it will reduce. So it is better than cleaning, but sanitizing kills more of the bacteria and uh, some of the virus. Whereas disinfectants, the use of disinfectants is called disinfecting. That is where you get real reduction of bacteria and virus. 
So if you want to do a reduction, you have to do a disinfection treatment. But again, disinfection is not 100%. It might achieve 99%. So if you really want to go 100%, then you'll have to sterilize. And there it's not practical to do for a very large area, for example. So usually sterilization is done for equipment, like for surgical equipment, either through heat or through chemicals, they're sterilized. But for general commercial buildings, situations where pest managers are called in to carry out disinfection service, there's no need to go for sterilization, it's for disinfection. But the mere cleaning and sanitizing is not enough. So if you're using disinfectants and if you're doing a disinfection service, please don't say I'm sanitizing. You're not sanitizing, you're disinfecting. So please remember these words and the basic differences in the terminology. And if you can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so here we see how disinfectants, sanitizers, and sterilizers are different. I've shown you a very simple image at the bottom. <laughs> the sanitizers are strong, the disinfectants are stronger, and the sterilizers are the strongest. So you can remember it that way. So the sanitizers, they reduce the bacteria, they also reduce virus, and they're strong. Disinfectants, on the other hand, they actually control, but they drastically reduce the bacteria and the virus, and they're stronger than the sanitizers. When it comes to the sterilizers, they actually eliminate, because there are spores, the bacteria have spores. In layman's language, if you like, eggs, if you want to say. And those are destroyed by sterilization and not by disinfection. But virus is destroyed by disinfectants. The virus is so tiny, so small, it's almost like a spore itself, but it's destroyed by disinfectants. So you don't really need a sterilizer for virus. But for bacteria, for certain bacteria, for surgical instruments, for example, you do need sterilizers. So if you can move to the next slide. So where is disinfection service done? In the past, it was done only in hospitals, food processing, pharma. But now there's an explosion of disinfection services in commercial building, in homes, in animal housing in transport, transport in planes, in buses, in trains, hospitality, in hotels, restaurants, clubs, pubs, office conditions, warehouses, all sorts of commercial buildings, uh, disinfection service is now being done. And this market is exploding and growing. And it's a great future opportunity for pest managers, especially in times like this, when the people's clients focus is more on disease control rather than on traditional pests. This is a great opportunity. Okay, the next slide. So who does uh, disinfection service? Professionals do, janitorial staff and home managers. Professional pest managers today are engaged in doing disinfection service. You can see one of them on the photo in the, on the left corner, carrying out a disinfection service. And there are also janitors the cleaning type of staff who also do disinfection service, and the homeowner also does disinfection service at home using disinfectants. So there are three broad categories of people, and you are the professional. So you need to be properly equipped much better than a janitor or a homeowner. You need to wear the right PP, you need to have the right grooming, make sure your nails are cut, your hair is combed, and you look clean. <laughs> You're going to carry out disinfection service against disease. So you shouldn't look like a diseased individual. You really need to look very smart when you go in there. And of course, uh, fully covered and operational to carry out this kind of service. You also need to be better informed. You need to know much more than a janitor or a homeowner. Homeowner janitors too today have Google and they go there and ask Dr. Google <clears throat> all these questions on disinfectants. And by the time you go there, they are better informed and they may start firing questions from you. So it's very, very important that you upgrade your knowledge and take advantage of webinars like this that UPL provides to improve your knowledge on uh, disinfection service. And this is only a basic uh, webinar today and there will be more webinars taking you to a more advanced level in the future. So be a professional, be well-groomed and be better informed. Okay, the regulatory aspects of disinfection. Each country has got its own uh, regulatory body to register disinfectants. And uh, I have just classified this into two main groups, just taking a few countries as examples. 
for example, starting on your left with the United States of America, for example, the AIT is considered a pesticide and comes under the registration of pesticides under the EPA. The EPA, the Environmental Protection Authority, is involved in registering them, but it also involves the FDA, the US Food and Drug Authority. And the reason for that is some disinfectants, and our focus today is surface disinfectants. These are pesticides and they come under the EPA, but then there are some disinfectants that are used to apply on stored food, for example, either on or in food. So that's where the FDA, the Food and Drug Authority, gets involved in approving such disinfectants. And then you get the CDC, the Center of Disease Control, who make recommendations on what disinfectants can be used. And if you go to their websites, you'll find much more information uh, leading you to different uh, topics on disinfectants, what can be used, what they recommend. And below you see on the left hand side, Europe. Europe too sees it as a pesticide, as a biocide, and it requires registration, just like how uh, registration of all biocides are done in Europe. So this is one group of uh, regulatory bodies. Then if you go around to your right hand side, in these countries, it is seen as a, it comes under the drug authority. For example, in India, it's a central drug standard, central organization. If you go to Sri Lanka, it's the National Medicines Regulatory Authority. In Malaysia, it's a National Pharmaceutical Regulatory Agency. In Australia, you can see in the corner, there's a Therapeutic Goods Administration, TGA. So they monitor what happens with disinfectants. They are the ones who approve disinfectants and they register. In some situations, they even don't need registration. You could still have some disinfectants with uh, small claims, but if you are trying to claim for virus, bacteria, and so on, they definitely need to be registered and they come under the uh, drug authority. But whether they come under the drug authority or whether they come under the pesticide authority, the fact remains that these are chemical pesticides. These are chemical disinfectants. These are not human medicines. These are not something to drink. These are not, some, not something to inject. These are not something that you can spray on human beings. These are chemicals, and please consider them as chemicals, as chemical disinfectants, as chemical pesticides, and be very careful with their use. Okay, the next slide. So no matter which regulatory body, they all have some uh, commonality. For example, to uh, read the label, to use uh, the PPE, uh, to protect your skin, your eyes, uh, especially your lungs by covering your nose. Uh, there's also corrosive warning to be careful where you spray. And they also apply with care the approved target surface. So the target surface is always what? The inanimate hard surface. It's not human being. And also to take care of people and, and the environment as well. Okay, the next slide. So what about the future of disinfection service? I mentioned this before. The future is that we need to transform this industry to become more professional and also to be able to have digital and high tech products. Sure, the chemicals will be always needed, but you need digital and high tech to, tools to monitor, for example. Is the treatment really effective? Good training, standards, SOP, standard operating procedures and strategic application so that we don't have to just go and blast everywhere, but be more strategic in our application uh, with the disinfectants. The next slide, please. Okay, so thank you for your attention. That brings me to the end of my talk, and I'll be seeing you later on with the question and answers. At the end, we'll have a question and answer session. So please use the uh, chat box found at the bottom of your software. Uh, you will see a box there for chat. Enter your questions. Even as we speak, you can enter your questions there. So when you come to the end to the question and answer session, we will answer all these questions for you as a panel with all the speakers. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the next speaker, Dr. Patho Dang, independent consultant from the Philippines. Dr. Patho Dang is an entomologist, consultant, and an entrepreneur based in Manila in the Philippines. He took his uh, doctorate from the University of Madras, India, in the year 1994. He has published a number of books on urban pest control. He's a prolific writer and speaker around the world on subjects related to pest management, environment, climate change, and business. So let's welcome Dr. Patho Oh, Okay. So thank you, Raja. And uh, 
good morning to uh, good morning and good afternoon to people all over the world wherever you are hope you are safe uh, before i begin my presentation i think i should be thanking uh, upl for putting all of this uh, together particularly the upl uh, uh, it team doing a wonderful job to make this complex thing really happen well uh, raja briefly mentioned uh, very well about the introduction about uh, disinfection services uh, but um, let me tell you one thing before i begin uh, my presentation the golden rule and the basic difference uh, between uh, pest control services what we are uh, used to and uh, doing germicidal or uh, or disinfection service is uh, we don't see the microorganisms they are not visible uh, unlike uh, pests which are very visible you can see a rat you can see a cockroach you can see termites or stored product beetles but you don't see the germs and microorganisms uh, in your eyes so obviously uh, the rule of engagement uh, is pretty different when you go into disinfection services so today i'm going to talk about uh, disease causing microorganisms uh, the next slide please well i'll be talking very briefly about uh, uh, very basics about these microorganisms because i think before you step into your client it is extremely important for you to know exactly what you are looking at now today of course the world has been gripped by the cause of a single virus but tomorrow when the virus is what will happen to your disinfection service are you going to close For example the covid 19 pandemic is over and you have invested money into disinfection services would you close your services and go back to your basic but this way it's important that disinfection work can continue because apart from covid there are millions of germs around so you can continue to run your business on the principle of disinfection and and uh, uh, and continue with that so it is important for you to know exactly what are, what we are talking about today i'll briefly discuss to you about the different types of uh, microorganisms which we come across how they look how they reproduce or multiply and what are the diseases they carry and cause us next one so what are microorganisms simple definition they are simply microscopic organisms and where do we find them everywhere including air solid and liquid surfaces outside and inside bodies of animals and plants household objects items which ever we see around so they are practically present everywhere there's a picture of a bread there which has been kept on the table for a few days and you see fungus growing there those are actually microorganisms so that's how they look like when if somebody wants to know how they look like that's a very common example to show you what microorganisms are next one next well what's the importance of microorganisms because you're going into a business so you, they have to be really important yes most microorganisms are harmless you have to know that but some cause diseases that's where the, the disinfection business starts and many of these diseases are actually in fact fatal if not treated so obviously you are actually getting into a very serious type of business if you are considering that as your business uh, uh, in the next uh, uh, years to come to the next well that's that's a very important thing classification of microorganisms how many different types of microorganisms are there if you are launching yourself into the industry there are types there are bacteria there are something called protozoans or protozoa there are fungus or fungi there are algae some species of algae and of course there are the virus which everybody hears nowadays so the examples of uh, each of them which i mentioned here bacteria for example lactobacillus lactobacillus the one exactly the bacteria which converts your milk into yogurt or cheese that's a beneficial bacteria that's an example of a bacteria a good bacteria some protozoans like amoeba or paramecium are some of the examples of protozoans fungi the mold the picture of the bread mold is sub before actually it's a fungus some algae like 
Spirogyra or cyanobacteria. These are algae commonly present in the environment. And of course, example of uh, a virus, let's say COVID-19, obviously very popular now through the bad things. Next one. Now let me quickly uh, give an introduction about each of these uh, microorganisms one by one, so you know exactly what they are. They are definitely different from each other. Let's start with bacteria. Bacteria are microscopic single-celled organisms that thrive in diverse environments. These organisms live in soil, in ocean, and even inside human gut or human stomach, for example. Human relationship with bacteria is very complex. Example, sometimes bacteria lend us a helping hand, such as by causing milk to turn into yogurt or making milk to turn into cheese. These are beneficial bacteria. But there are other bacteria which are destructive, causing diseases. The next one. For example, these are the bacterial diseases, cholera, tuberculosis, tetanus, typhoid, leprosy, syphilis. You have different bacteria causing different diseases. <laughs> We have the next slide. Now, how do they look like? Well, everything is microscopic, so you can never see them in any surfaces. But as you see, there are different types and shapes. Bacteria are actually single cell organisms, also known as prokaryotes. The two core of an inner cell membrane and an outer cell wall. And the very important thing is they lack a nucleus. They do not have a nucleus unlike protozoans. That's a very, the basic difference. However, they contain a strand of DNA, which helps them to multiply. Now, bacteria are classified just because of by their shapes. There are spherics, which are round in shape. There are cylindricals, which are called rods. And there are spirals. And in the picture on the left, you can clearly see that bacteria have been divided just because of these three different major categories of shapes. But remember, these are all microscopic. You can see them only under a microscope. The next one. The next slide. How do bacteria reproduce? Simple. Most bacteria multiply by a process called binary fission. In this process, a single bacterial cell called the parent cell makes a copy of its DNA and grows larger by doubling its cellular content first. And then the cell then splits apart, pushing the duplicated material out and creating it an identical daughter cell. So it's a very simple division. The cell divides into two, and two, uh, two becomes four and four, something like that. So it's a geometric proportion they grow, grow, in, uh, grow and reproduce. It's a simple process called binary fission. Okay, next one. But there is also called bacteria also reproduce through a process called button. In this case, the daughter cell grows as an offshoot of the parent. It starts off as a small nub, grows until it is the same size as its parents, and then split off. The DNA found in the parent and the offspring after binary fission or budding is the same. That means they are all look alike. So these are the two basic methods by which a bacteria multiplies itself. The next one. Now, the second one is the protozoans. Protozoans are exactly look like bacteria because they are also single cell animals. Because they are animal like behavior, the movement and predation. They are individually, they can move like an animal. That's why they are known as a single cell animal, whereas a bacteria needs to be carried by a host. But they differ from bacteria in lacking a cell wall, okay, having a distinct nucleus. That's the basic difference. They are also cylindric, they are also round, they are in the similar shapes and size. The protozoans are distinct, have a distinct nucleus. Thus, they are called eukaryotes. They are either free living or parasitic. Some others are symbiotic or common cells, living in association with other organisms. The next cell. The next slide, please. Protozoa can also parasitize, causing various diseases in animals, including humans. This is where the importance of protozoans come in our life, and also in our business. 
among common human infections caused by protozoa are diarrheal diseases due to entamoeba histolytica and malaria due to several species of plasmodium, African sleeping sickness, or something which is caused by Trifanosoma gambiensi, palazar, which is very common in parts of India, for example, caused by Leishmania. So these are some of the diseases which are caused by protozoans. Okay, plasmodium. Of course, uh, most of us are very, uh, uh, very frequently know about uh, uh, plasmodium falciparum simply because it's been carried uh, carried by anopheles mosquitoes uh, around the globe as a disease causes. There are also Chagas diseases, which is uh, again spread by a triatom buck. Of course, entomotor histologica amoebiasis is a very common food and uh, uh, water and food contamination causes diarrhea and that's also caused by a certain protozoan. The next slide. How do protozoans look like? Well, they are also coming come in different shapes and sizes. I've shown you some basic pictures there. They come in many different shapes and sizes ranging from amoeba which can change its shape to paramecium which is fixed in shape and complex in structure. The next one. How do they reproduce? They have both type of asexual and sexual reproduction. And most protozoa reproduce asexually, of course, by cell division, They're exactly the same what we saw uh, uh, with, uh, with bacteria, it's simply divide into two. The cell division is sometimes a longitudinal, it takes place along the lung, also sometimes it can traverse the other side. So there are different ways of divisions. I've given an example of a picture there of a simple cell division taking place in a protozoa. So, which is a longitudinal. The next one. The third type of microorganism here is the fungus. A fungus is a member of a group of eukaryotes, organism that includes microorganisms such as yeast and molds. Basically, if you, if a, if if a person want to really understand what fungus are, yeast and molds are some of the common examples of fungus. Unique point about fungus is the presence of chitin in the cell. Other organisms like protozoans and bacteria do not contain chitin in their in their in their cell wall. That is one of the things which distinguish fungus from other organisms. No other microorganism has this characteristic. Fungi do not photo photosynthesize. That means they do not contain chlorophyll. That means they are dependent on something else, on their host. So they are parasitic mostly. Okay, but they do have a process called heterotrophs. They are also known as heterotrophs. They acquire their food by absorbing or dissolved molecules, typically by secreting a digestive enzyme. Exactly the example what I showed is the bread mold. It, it pushes the enzyme into the into the bread, dissolves it, and sucks it. In. So it is it is also known as a heterotroph. So these are the two different. Uh, 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 this is one of the method by which a fungus feeds. Okay, Next slide. Well, uh, we know fungus uh, quite well as an entomologist or people working in the pest control industry because uh, uh, of this reason, many insects also engage in mutualistic relationship with fungi. Several groups of ants cultivate fungi as their primary food source. Ambrosia beetle cultivate various species of fungi in the bark of trees that are infest, uh, that they infest. And of course, we know termites. We possibly we, we all work on termites, and termites are very closely associated with fungi, particularly those higher uh, group of uh, fungi uh, uh, termites. They cultivate fung uh, fungus in their in their in their in their mound, and that fungus becomes their food. So fungus are quite important uh, 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 quite important to insects in some way or other. The next slide, please. But there it comes. Fungus are quite important to us economically. Many fungus are parasitic on plants, animals, including humans. Many fungus are serious pathogens of many cultivated plants causing extensive damage and losses to agriculture and forestry. This is where we know, we commonly know, the fungus are actually our, our big disease causer in agriculture. So obviously a fungicide is, is, is a big business for uh, agrochemical companies. Fungus are actually a, are important pathogens when it comes to commercial uh, valuation. The next slide. But fungi are also cause diseases to, uh, okay, so here's a list of uh, fungal diseases I've listed out. I'm not going to read them all, but uh, you, you, if you notice uh, the diseases, they're quite common diseases all over the world in different crops, which are caused by various species of fungus. The next slide.
the next one. But yes, fungus also cause human diseases, and I have given you some examples here. Histoplasmosis, the most most common among all of these uh, uh, fungal diseases which are uh, caused to humans is this candidiasis caused by a fungus called Candida albicans. This is, and also there is something called Aspergillosis caused by a species called Aspergillus fumigatus. There are different species of uh, Aspergillus which causes the same diseases. So obviously. Fungus are also important when it comes to uh, 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 human human uh, beings, and disinfection also can include this type of uh, uh, work uh, uh, and diseases which are mentioned here. The next slide, please. How does fungus reproduce? Yes, by production of uh, spores. They reproduce by spore formations. Fungi reproduce asexually by fragmentations, budding, and production of spores, fragments of hyphae can grow into new colonies, that means a piece of hyphae, the, uh, something like, like what uh, the plants, uh, the trees have roots, fungus have this called hyphae, this portion can just break off and each of the hyphae can actually grow to become a new fungus. So, so there are three different modes a fungus uh, reproduces, asexually by fragmentation, budding and by production of spores, okay, the next one. The next slide. The fourth uh, microorganisms which talk about are algae. And al algae or algae are basically uh, very common. Uh, I mean, we have seen them all over uh, water bodies. They are also microorganisms. They are in, uh, invisible, but they are sometimes big also, like this. Algae are photosynthetic. That's one of the difference between algae and fungi. They have chlorophyll. That's why they look green in color. Okay. Most are aquatic. Most algae are aquatic, lack many a distinct cell and tissue types, such as tomato, xylem, phloem, and are found in land plants. This is another thing which differs algae from plants, land plants, because they, they, they lack xylem and uh, phloem uh, and stomata and things like that. So, so they are different from fungus and they are also different from land plants, but they look exactly like a plant because they, they are green in color. Some of them are microscopic, but there are largest and the most complex marine algae are known as seaweeds. I and mean, we have seen seaweeds. These are huge uh, uh, weeds. Uh, if you go and walk around a sea beach, you'll see that these are huge ones. And these are also, these are not plants. These are algae, actually. They are algae. So this is a very complex uh, one. But the one which is very common in, in, in uh, lakes and ponds is, is, a, is an algae species called spirogaron. The one which I show in the picture there, you can, you can see them in uh, lakes and ponds uh, around their houses and stuff like that. So that is an, al an algae and that also comes under microorganism. Uh, uh, it's classified as a microorganism even though some of them are microscopic. They are big uh, uh, and large. The, uh, the most recent estimates suggest it's about 72,500 70 algal species worldwide. So they are quite prominent in, in our environment. The next one. Yeah, they look of uh, different sizes and shapes. Here is an example of, on the left side. These are uh, uh, these are algae which are microscopic. You can see them only under microscope. They come in different shapes and sizes, different colors, different pig pigments they contain. On the right side, there is, of course, the, the largest uh, uh, algal bloom. You can see uh, in the sea or in lakes. They are uh, large in, uh, 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 when they look, uh, when you look, uh, take a look at them. The next slide. Yes, this is one of the pictures where I'm showing you exactly how uh, how al algae reproduces. They, they reproduce in a different form. They have uh, sexual forms as well as uh, sexual formations. Many small algae reproduce asexually by ordinary cell division or by fragmentation. The next one. Uh, this is one of the most common algal, algal diseases which uh, is common. This is known as uh, red tide. The people who are uh, from the Philippines who have registered here will possibly notice this is very common when it comes to seafood markets and seafood uh, eating. You can see uh, uh, red color areas of sea where, 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 where the algae grows and the, then the fish feeds on this algae. They, they carry a toxin and when you consume the uh, fish, uh, without uh, proper or un, uh, 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 not cooked properly, you will get that diseases. So that that, that red tide actually is uh, nothing but a, a, a species of 
algae, or it's not algal, it causes something called algal bloom, which we, we, uh, we commonly see in parts of uh, uh, the world. The next one. The next slide, yeah. Of course, the last uh, type of microorganism is a virus, which we are uh, talking about nowadays. A vi the, the, the very unique point about a virus is it's actually can be, uh, can be categorized between a non-living and a living state. So that is the very peculiar about virus. They can, they can be called as a particle, non-living particle, and also they can be called as a living particle. So that is uh, very unique in virus. A virus is sub microscopic infectious agent that multiplies only inside a living cell or organism they can only live and multiply inside an organism they need a host okay they can contain a dna and rna and the outer covering of the virus is actually having a protein layer that's how it is it's a simple structure a dna or rna in the in, in the middle and a protein coat outside virus can infect all types of life forms from animals plants to even microorganisms about 5,000 virus species have been described in details, but there, are, but there are millions of types of viruses in the environment which has not been described and it doesn't concern us. Viruses are found in almost every ecosystem on Earth and are most numerous type in the biological entity. The next slide, please. The next slide. Virus, when not inside an infected cell or in the process of infecting a cell, virus exists in the form of an independent particle called viron. Okay, so they can exist as a, as a particle, a non-living particle anywhere. But once they go inside a cell, for example, in COVID, it comes, they go inside a, a cell in the lung. Okay, so, 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 so they become active, they, they started living. So when infected, a host cell is forced to rapidly produce thousands of identical copies of this original virus. Thousands then escape the host cell and move to the infect other cells. So this is how a virus uh, goes in. The particle or the viron goes inside a cell. It multiplies inside the cell. It becomes millions and it infects the next host cell. And then ulti ultimately it explodes and goes out of the system. So virus uh, has a unique way of infecting. Uh, cells and uh, uh, bodies. The next slide, please. This is how virus looks like. They are different shapes and sizes. You can you can see them in, in all sorts of forms. And if you look at this particular picture, you can see uh, uh, all of these are very important human disease causing viruses. One is causing a HIV, another is a hepatitis B, Ebola virus, adenovirus, influenza virus, and there are bacteriophages. So there are different types of uh, viruses that each are having unique uh, sections uh, sizes the next slide please this is what did they do a virus first gets inside a cell you can see start from the, the topmost picture it goes inside the cell it injects its dna or rna into the host cell this dna and rna takes over the host cells dna and rna it uses it to multiply itself into many from 10, it becomes 100. From 100, it becomes 1,000. And once it becomes 1,000, the cell explodes, liberating these viruses outside. And that's where the virus comes for it. Go out to another cell, they infect another cell, and another cell until it becomes too many. And that's the time it escapes the body and goes for the next host. So this is how the virus infect a host cell. The next slide, please. Well, viruses are important uh, uh, disease carriers, and uh, they, they themselves uh, um, do um, cause a lot of diseases in plants and animals. Here, I'm just giving you a quick examples of some of the virus uh, uh, causing diseases in plants. All types of uh, uh, diseases are here. You can see uh, I've given an example of rice and cucumber and tomatoes and potatoes, sugarcane, cauliflower. They all of these plants actually are been infected by viruses at different times and space. Similar to uh, plants, the next slide. Viruses also cause diseases to uh, animals and humans. The next slide. Uh, I've given an example, another list of uh, common uh, uh, diseases caused by virus, common cold, hepatitis, cancer, SARS, AIDS, 
rabies, mumps, polio, chikungunya, dengue, chicken pox, measles. So uh, the list can go on. So practically every type of important of diseases in humans are also uh, of viral origin. The next slide. Of course, uh, uh, it, a few slides on COVID, which you're talking about. Uh, everybody has done his own research now. Everybody knows there's a common uh, information now. Uh, just, I just want to uh, brush you uh, over it. COVID-19, of course, is a virus belonging to the group called coronavirus. The word corona means crown, and the virus resemble, of course, a crown. On 11th of February, WHO chose the name COVID-19 to describe this uh, form or the strain of a virus. Initially, this virus was described as 2019 NCOV. COVID, of course, refers to the coronavirus family. The D comes, stands for disease, and the 19, of course, the year of outbreak. That's how the name of COVID-19 came through. The next slide. The next slide, please. Yes. Well, this coronavirus uh, 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 causes respiratory and central nervous system diseases. Uh, uh, and the, the, actually, the, the whole coronavirus family is, is a large family. Of, they contain many types and many strains of viruses. Okay. So it can cause different types of symptoms, like I have mentioned here, respiratory, central nervous system, hepatitic and gastrointestinal symptoms in humans. So, so, so they can cause different types of diseases, different types of SARS also belongs to the family of uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 also belongs to the same coronavirus. So they belong to the same family, but they have different symptoms. And we are aware of uh, SARS a couple of years uh, back uh, in, in 2002 and 2003, how it uh, caused uh, diseases. So that belongs to the same family of coronavirus. So these outbreak demonstrated that animal-human transmission and later human-to-human -human transmission, that's very important. And that it comes to business part of it. it. It can be transmitted through surfaces. It can be transmitted from animal to human and even from human to human. So that's where uh, deception infection becomes quite important how to cut down the chain of the virus transmission. The next slide, please. The next slide. Can you go to the next slide? Then it is done. It is done. Okay, so this is uh, uh, this is a, a, a simple example exactly how COVID nineteen is spread, and they have compared uh, COVID with other diseases. Okay, like you look into the transmission rate. The R O is a figure which which explains the the, the contagious nature of these viruses. Now, hepatitis C virus, Ebola virus, HIV, SARS, mumps, and measles. These are all virus viral diseases. Okay, so the transmission wise. They say hepatitis has the least RO value and measles has the highest RO value. That means if you if you have one person getting infected by one of the diseases, what's the chance of him transmitting to the next person? So it is three in Ebola and five in HIV and seven in SARS and things like that. So WHO classifies COVID-19 uh, uh, to be in between Ebola and HIV. The blue arrow shows where the transmittability of COVID-19 is in the rate of transmission. Of uh, or, or, or the nature of contagious nature of it. So this is where WHO classifies it between 1.4 and 2.5 in between Ebola and HIV. But some researchers are showing that it is as bad as SARS. It is coming as close as SARS. That is number four. So this is how uh, contagious COVID-19 is. The next slide, please. This is also one uh, uh, one slide to show you exactly why we are talking about people to stay six feet or two meters away from each other. So when you cough or sneeze, this is how the aerosol from your nose and mouth spreads across. So if you see Ebola, the, the, you know, the distance is actually around three feet, the chance of uh, getting highest amount of uh, contamination. Whereas for COVID-19, you need to be away somewhere between six feet or two meters away from each other because of the aerosol coming from the infected person. The next slide, please. Well, this is what it is. I just want to have the last slide here. It is it, it is thought to be transmitted by air droplets. That's very important. You need to know about COVID. It, it goes by air droplets from an infected person by sneezing, 
coughing and being in contact with nose discharge and saliva droplets. So this is how COVID-19 spreads basically. These air droplets could land on a person's mouth, nose, or could be inhaled entirely. The next slide. <laughs> Currently, it is unknown if the COVID-19 can infect a person by being on the surface of an object and then transmit it to the mouth and nose. So this has still been studied, how, whether contact is one of the major cause. Can through contact with the hard surface, COVID-19 can be spread. But evidences are showing that yes, we, we can spread COVID-19 through hard surfaces. So use of disinfectant, of course, uh, comes very important in that sense. So uh, uh, which is very important is the last one. The COVID-19 is not transmitted by mosquito. Uh, 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 some of the persons were joking before, hope it was spread by mosquitoes so we can be in big business. But I tell that if it would have been spread by mosquito, we would have controlled this virus far better than what it is now. Because mosquitoes can be easily controlled and the spread of the disease can be easily would have been controlled. Uh, unlike uh, what it is, it is spread from human to human directly without a, uh, a, a organism in between. So uh, it is unfortunate or fortunate both ways. The next slide, please. The next slide. Yes, so to summarize, uh, these are important points uh, when it comes to a sense of uh, making a business out of uh, disinfection and microorganisms. Oh, everybody should note down microorganisms have economic significance. So obviously that gives you a sense of uh, uh, business uh, into it. Many of the microorganisms cause diseases. So obviously that brings uh, microorganisms and disinfection services uh, to prominence. Uh, clients will be talking about it. They would like to hear from you because it causes major diseases. They can cause death and even cripple economy. That's what is very important you can see. Even though you don't see much death around you, but you can see the, the shape of the economy around. So that is also one of the reasons that um, uh, disinfection services uh, uh, can play a significant role to give the, the security to people. Okay, that's very important. They are transmitted by direct contact, proximity, and through contaminated objects. Some are transmitted by pests, such as mosquitoes. So that's where uh, uh, you need to be. Uh, you are already in that uh, business, but uh, but uh, this one is quite different when it comes to COVID-19. Uh, but this, the last one, is very important. Disinfection barrier and social distancing are two major remedies for preventing spread of microbes. So basically, this is where you guys can think about or you can think how microorganisms or disinfection can become a, a part of business because you understand that disinfection actually can create a barrier, can kill the microorganism and prevent the spread of the disease. So this is very important. That's why I think you guys have shown your interest to join this uh, seminar. Thank you very much for uh, your patience uh, listening as uh, Raja has mentioned in his presentation. Uh, that we always ask questions in the chat box and we will definitely sit around and answer them uh, later. So uh, I'll uh, switch uh, now to uh, introduce uh, our next speaker in the line, uh, Mr. Uh, Ujjal Kwar. He is from UPL Limited, of course. Ujjal Kumar is an agriculture graduate and has completed his master's in business management. He has an expertise in designing customized agriculture and management plan and has vast experience in grain production and management. He has been engaged with various assignments relating to integrated pest management, grain protection and fumigation, and food safety management systems during his 26 plus years of services in this industry. So uh, uh, it's a privilege for me to now uh, inter um, uh, welcome uh, Ujwal uh, to present his presentation here. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome participants. Today, uh, I will be covering the chemistry part. And uh, my topic is selection of disinfectants, key considerations. So I will mute my video. And I request you all to post questions in the chat box uh, so that it can be answered by the panel at the end of the session. Next slide. 
So some basics. Uh, previous speakers have already talked about it, but again, as a recap, what is difference be between sterilization and the disinfection? In sterilization, we are aiming at 100% reduction of the microbial population wherever treatment is carried out. Whereas in case of disinfection, we are aiming at reduction in microbial load, but not 100% elimination. Because most of the disinfectants are not active, fully active against bacterial spores, which are present on the inanimate objects. So inanimate object means if we uh, come to the practical situation, all non-living structures around us are inanimate objects. So, so suppose if we talk about household situation in our house, we have got toilets, we have got wash basin, sinks, kitchen area, your drawing room, your uh, furnitures, curtains, wall, floor, everywhere microbes are there. And we have to address the microbial load uh, situation in a way we have to plan that we place cleaning schedules. We have got disinfection schedule in even in our house. We give more emphasis on the dis disinfection in uh, number one in the toilet area, number two in the kitchen area, in the dust bins. Similarly, in commercial situation, if we go, uh, we can see in the hospitals, we have got different situations that we have got the operation theaters, we have got ICU wards, we have got general wards, OPD and the common area. So for all these areas, different disinfection plan is there because on the non-living objects, microbes do settle and we have to address that. Next. The chemical compound which is used for disinfection is called as disinfectants and chemical compound which is used for a sterilization purpose is called as sterilants. Next. Today we are talking about surface disinfection. So we will just see some basics like what is difference between surface disinfection and air disinfection. So if you talk about surface disinfection, so whatever non-living objects are there around us, there loads of microbial deposition is there. So we have to form our strategy accordingly. And the frequency and extent of disinfection will depend on the risk of the risk area. Suppose you have got the contract of a food factory. So what I suggest that you should do the risk assessment of the entire food processing plant and you have to categorize the risk area as three risk areas, high risk, medium risk and low risk areas. And accordingly, you have to make your plan for the disinfection and the molecules what you are going to select will be as per your risk assessment. There are different types of uh, disinfection. One is routine disinfection in our house. We clean our toilets on routine basis. There is a method to clean. We clean our kitchen in a particular way. And this involves uses of disinfectants. We mop our floors using low level disinfectants. So there is a routine. Similarly, in case of hospitals or in case of offices, you have got the routine. So as a routine way, we have to do it. If you do not follow disinfection process in a routine way, this will lead to the unhygienic situation and there can be serious issue related to disease transmission also. But second one is terminal disinfection, which means when we are handing over one premises to the new occupant, it is it has to be terminally disinfected. For example, I will give you one example of uh, the industry that is hotel industry. So one guest checks out and another guest has to check in. So what happens in between? It is not smooth. When he checks out, there is a gap. The housekeeping team has got cleaning and disinfection plan. And that's why you see a band written in the toilet, which says that this toilet has been disinfected. So there is a process. We change bedrolls and then we clean the room. We do vacuum cleaning, everything is done. And then 
we check the as per the checklist and then we hand over it to the next guest similarly in the hospital situation when you see that one patient is to be discharged from a particular room and another patient has to come so in between even the routine disinfection has been done we have to do terminal disinfection we have to ensure that before a new occupant comes the disinfection is done as per the process third one is in the event of outbreaks what should be the disinfection plan what we are facing right right now is pandemic situation there is epidemic situation there is pandemic situation epidemic is confined to a certain geography but pandemic is throughout the globe so right now covid 19 issue is pandemic issue and in such cases there is set protocol protocol also and in case of acute crisis like now globe is facing acute crisis what we are doing government has taken all government has taken the control of the disinfection regime so there is clear guideline from the government that what exactly has to be done so if you see uh, the social distancing or the lockdowns whatever has been announced it's a preventive step what has been taken in terms that there is no cross infection from human to human or from object to human so in order to prevent the covid 19 spread government has taken the initiative as well as there is complete focus on disinfecting the common public area that is where this business opportunity comes to you that before covid 19 normally in all the countries across the globe focus of disinfection was in the healthcare segment only and it was not very focus was not given in details in the other public places but now the awareness is there there is a big opportunity then last one is targeted disinfection means if we see blood or pus cells or fecal material or lubricants around us which gives clear indication that if these depositions are there microbial load is bound to increase so we have when we see this kind of targeted situation we have to focus and we have to disinfect that particular area coming back to air disinfection so air disinfection actually targets the microorganism which are suspended in the air for that matter we use aerosol or vapors as fine droplets which hangs or suspends in the atmosphere and kills those microorganism next slide so now what is the mechanism of action so they can be disinfectants can be growth inhibitors and can have lethal action growth inhibition means those category of disinfectants who inhibits the growth of microbes like bacteria or fungi but doesn't kill it so when it inhibits the growth of bacteria it is called as bacteriostasis or when it inhibits the growth of fungi it is called as fungistasis so for example a sodium azide and thio marsal is used in laboratory as bacteriostasis and then sodium benzoate and potassium sorbate is used in food industry as food preservative which inhibits the growth of fungi without killing it in case of uh, quaternary ammonium it is fungistatic against certain trichophyton species but here in commercial disinfection space we are not looking at growth inhibitors we are looking at kill so that means whatever category of disinfectants are there available in the market should have lethal action against bacteria fungi and viruses so that is the target next slide so currently since focus is there on the was there on the healthcare pharma units and certain health supplement production units uh, worldwide pre high level uh, 
disinfectants, intermediate level disinfectants, low level disinfectants. So high level addresses high risk level areas or equipments. Med medium risk areas are covered by intermediate level disinfectants and low risk areas are covered by low level disinfectants. And typically what happens is that in case of high level disinfectants, it kills all microorganisms except for high numbers of bacterial spores. Means some bacterial spores it is able to kill but not all. Whereas in case of intermediate level disinfectants, it kills all microorganisms but do not necessarily kill bacterial spores. But in case of low level disinfectants, it kills most of the bacteria, not all. Some viruses and some fungi, but cannot kill the spores part. So this is the difference. It has been categorized as high level, intermediate and low disinfectant. Next. So now some key points I want to discuss here that uh, when you look for the chemistry, you should see that whether it is a solo or it's a combination chemistry. So both solo and combination chemistry is available in the market, such as hydrogen peroxide alone is a compound which is available as product in the market, then sodium chloride, quaternary ammonium, it is available, quaternary alcohol is available. And there are different combination chemistry. If you see EPA website and FDA website, you will get, you can download the complete list. So you will be amazed to see that how they have developed uh, the chemistries and how they have approved these products in USA. So there can be hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid combination. There can be combination of quaternary ammonium and ethanol and many such combinations are there. So once we decide on the chemistry, whether it is solo or combination, we need to see whether it is a approved, it, it is in the approved list of chemical in your country or not. Approved means it has to be governed by a certain authority. As Mr. Raja Mandran has already discussed, given example of few countries. I will give you example of USA, where EPA and FDA both are handling this particular regime. But if you see carefully, FDA deals with those disinfectants and sterilants which are used in high risk areas. So mainly they deal with the sterilants and EPA, the medium and low level disinfectants they are using. So there is a thin line between pesticide uh, regulatory authority and the pharma regulatory authority, healthcare regulatory authority in the US. So, this is the case scenario of US. If I uh, discuss about India, it falls under Drugs and Cosmetic Acts. So it is considered, disinfect disinfectants are considered as uh, drugs in India. Uh, same is the case in Malaysia also. Uh, I have come to know about Sri Lanka also. It falls under the same regime. Then we need to see the concentration. So disinfectants are not interchangeable, which means that there are different group of disinfectants like alcohol, chlorine, aldehydes, peroxides, iodophores, and all these groups have got a specific target of the organism. So it cannot be interchanged. Suppose in one premises, you need in three critical areas, you need three different chemistries uh, in high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And when you have gone for the operation, you have identified that you don't have all three chemistries available. So you decided that uh, I have got just uh, two chemistries available and these two chemistries are uh, medium level and low level. So you increase the dose and you try to control microbes in the high risk area that will simply not work. It will be a waste of time and money cost will be more and result will not come. So you need to understand the chemistry. I will give example of five molecules because today time is limited. In advanced module, we will discuss more about the chemistry part. Then is human exposure. So in healthcare segment, occupational health hazard has been reported for the cleaning personnel. Those who are involved in cleaning and disinfection process in healthcare segment, this has been reported. 
that's why precaution has to be taken as per the label claim and minimum exposure of human beings should be there in toxic environment of the disinfectant next slide please now what are the factors that affects the efficacy of disinfection location and number of microorganism matters a lot in your household situation only if you see that your critical most area for microorganism is your toilet area similarly in case of hospitals if you see icus then operation theaters then iccu neonatal ward these are all very sensitive areas and wherever we are uh, storing the bio waste in the hospital these are very critical areas so there we can understand that if we are not taking due precaution there can be chance of high number of microorganism and various experiments have proved that in this for same microorganism if count is very high and very low same molecule takes more time to kill large number of population that's why you need to assess the area because we are fighting against invisible enemy so this is very important then there is resistance also of microorganism towards allowing disinfectant to penetrate microorganism so if you see uh, that the spores they have got spore coat and cortex which acts as barrier you have got mycobacteria which has got waxy cell wall and you have got in gram negative bacteria you have got outer membrane so all these layerings it stops the entry of disinfectant inside the microbial regime and that's why there is issue so most of these disinfectants they cannot penetrate the microbial spores then comes concentration and potency so each chemistry has got different potency and different concentration has to be used except for iodophores which is iodine compound where higher is the concentration higher is the kill lesser is the time so only in case of iodophores this is applicable but rest all disinfectant this principle is not applicable you increase the dose and you try to reduce the exposure period or you expect higher kill that will not happen in other disinfectant case i will give you example of one combination chemistry which is quaternary ammonium and phenol ratio is 1 is to 6 so now quaternary ammonium is ratio 1 and phenol is ratio 6 we want to reduce the concentration of quaternary ammonium by half yet we want to achieve the similar result so in that case you have to increase concentration of phenolic compound by 64 times then only you can achieve that target kill so this is very important there is one more chemistry uh, there is one more comparison that is phenol versus alcohol in case of m tuberculosis so phenol will take more time to address m tuberculosis in load and alcohol will take less time so this factor is very important that you need to understand the chemistry now comes physical and chemical factors so temperature in general principle higher the temperature better is the efficacy of disinfectants but if it is very high temperature situation in that case sometimes disinfectants may degrade and it will affect the efficacy second important most factor is about ph so certain compounds in high ph situation works well efficacy improves just like glutaraldehyde and quaternary ammonium they work very well when ph is high whereas in high ph condition phenolic group hypochlorites and iodines they have got adverse effect so their efficacy will reduce so you need to check that what is the ph and how it is correlated with the molecule what you are using then comes relative humidity so in case of ethylene oxide sterilization 
this factor is very critical because 33 percent of relative immunity moisture is considered as ideal for best effective sterilization using ethylene oxide if there is variation down or up in relative immunity this affects the treatment last one is water hardness so water hardness in general it leads to settling down of the disinfectant molecules at the bottom of the water liquid solution so hard water should not be used while making emulsion or the while diluting this formulation for the uses next is organic and inorganic matter so same visible uh, organic matters can be serum blood pus cells fecal material lubricants what happens that all these compound they react with your disinfectant molecule and it makes it ineffective or less effective duration of exposure is also very important uh, because each molecule has got different duration of exposure for achieving proper kill and last one is biofilms biofilms is nothing but a group of microbes tightly held together and they live like a community and they are attached to the surfaces where you want to conduct the treatments so if biofilm presence is there in any environment it will be very difficult to have disinfection program in place so you need to have different strategy for that next now type of disinfectants in application terms hand disinfectant air water surface disinfectants for human body part or body fluid different disinfectants are there for devices medical and non medical different uh, disinfectants are used so it is categorized like this and then intensity wise you have got high level intermediate level low level i have already discussed this and then if you see uh, the mechanism they can be uh, oxidants means it oxidizes organic material they can be electrophilic agents which inactivates the enzyme of the macrobes then they can be cationic uh, membrane they can destabilize membranes and they can act as weak acids which disturbs the ph balance of the microbial environment next so what is the characteristic of a good disinfectant what i have discussed based on that we have got the seven categories so broad spectrum effectiveness we are fighting against invisible enemy and we have assessed the area but we do not know what is the load so the chemistry what you have to select shall have broad spectrum shall have effect on on broader range of microorganism not the narrow range for example alcohol doesn't have uh, what broader broad spectrum and then halogen group has got broad spectrum they should be active and stable in case of alcohol it evaporates faster even before the kill time what is prescribed there for alcohol it may evaporate so such volatile compound which is not stable should not be in your disinfection program it should be safe for people and animals for example hydrogen peroxide and paras parasitic acid have been found safer as compared to quaternary alcohol quaternary ammonia phenolics and bleach similarly they should support environment environmentally it should be safe so hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid and are safer as compared to quaternary alcohol quaternary ammonium phenols and bleach after that it should not damage the structures of the substance around in the treatment area so ideally uh, any disinfectant will not have compatibility with uh, all structures around but if you see uh, hydrogen peroxide and parasitic acid and quaternary ammonia they are more compatible as compared to alcohols phenolics and bleach and 
it should be affordable we all are in the business so you our customer must be in a position to afford our services in turn we should source a product which is cost effective for you and then in turn it will be cost effective for the customer and it should have convenience straight forwardness for the uses it should not be very complex in application next slide so while selecting disinfectants you need to look for the speed of this disinfection which is contact time you will be surprised to know that none of this disinfectants has got instant knockdown or kill effect on touch on contact it needs to take some time depending upon molecule to molecule to have mortality effect on the macros so contact time is very important if contact time is more for a particular molecule your droplet size of the emulsion should be bigger as compared to if contact time is less it can be finer but for bigger contact time they should stay there on the surface so this is very important and the spectrum as i have discussed in the previous slide that is also important and you should select broad spectrum uh, disinfectants cleaning ability cleaning as a thumb rule whenever disinfection is carried out in any area cleaning should precede it should be it should act as a preventive measure which will support the disinfection program but you should look for the molecules which has got surfactants which has got cleaning ability also so that will act even better when you have cleaned the area and you are using a compound which has got cleaning ability having surfactant in the product makeup so that will help then personal safety comes so voc that is volatile organic compound it should be free ideally but uh, there is no ideal situation so we need to look for better chemistry which has which has got comparatively safer for uh, human health that is it should be ideally it should be non toxic non irritating to skin's eyes and respiration non sensitizing so use amongst uh, the available disinfectant you need to compare on this parameter also so safety and efficacy there should be a balance and it should support environmental profile also material compatibility also and ease of the application and cost effective next slide so uh, i have uh, taken the groups of uh, chemistry so most of your disinfectant will fall under all these 13 groups of the chemistry for example there are alcohol group where ethanol and isopropanol is widely used in this group in aldehydes you have got glutaraldehydes and formaldehydes formaldehydes uh, in many countries have been phased out glutaraldehyde is in use uh in case of uh, heavy metals you have got silver compounds mercury compounds copper compounds zinc compounds in peroxides you have got hydrogen peroxide ozone and parasitic acid so like that whatever uh, disinfectants are there shall fall under this uh, these categories and in advanced module we will talk more about each category of uh, these chemistry so that you know the chemistry part the action part and whatever details or criticalities are associated with each molecule that you will come to know next slide so i will uh, i have just given here five case studies of five molecules so one molecule is quaternary alcohol so it's not a broad spectrum uh, molecule speed is very good 2 to 5 minutes but there is a challenge that it's a volatile in nature it may dry before impact it may not even stay for 2 to 5 minutes so that is the issue that it is not recommended for indoor or outdoor uh, disinfection so toxicity as per epa it falls under caution warning or danger category it is not safe for environment and it is not compatible for the surfaces also it may damage nasal irritation or uh, burn skin eyes it's flammable also so not even safe for people and animals 
Pre-cleaning is required while using quaternary alcohol and PPE is must and proper ventilation should be there. Next. Next molecule what I have taken is accelerated hydrogen peroxide. It's broad spectrum in effectiveness and speed is also good one to five minutes. And as per EPA, it has been kept in caution, safest possible. It's uh, like safer chemistry they are declaring uh, as per EPA. It supports environment. It's, it's not uh, affecting against the environment. Compatibility to the surfaces is also excellent and safe for uh, the workers or human being or animals. So no health effect, but precaution has to be taken in all the cases when, whenever you are using disinfectant, you take precaution. So minimum PPE, what has to be used, which will be discussed in next session, has to be used. Pre-cleaning, not required, but as a protocol, we must do pre-cleaning before we use disinfectants and PPE shall also be used uh, as a precautionary measure. Next. Next is parasitic acid. So it is also broad spectrum. Speed is very quick, two to five minutes. It also falls under caution, same as that of uh, the previous chemistry. It's safe for environment, compatible for uh, surfaces good compatibility, safer for human beings. Pre-cleaning again, not recommended here, but we will do it as a protocol. Industry protocol, we will do pre-cleaning. And PPE has to be used at when you are handling concentrate, but when you are diluting it, you should use gloves and ventilation is required. Next. Next uh, compound is quaternary ammonium compound. So this is also broad spectrum, but here kill time is three to 10 minutes. So longer time it takes, uh, falls under caution category. It's not safe for environment. And compatibility with the surfaces is good, but not safe for human being. It can have skin uh, related issues and nasal irritation. Pre-cleaning again, not recommended, but at protocol we will follow this. And PPE, again, we have to use in this case. Next. And last example, what I have taken is of phenolics, not a broad spectrum uh, effectiveness. Speed is slow, 10 minutes it takes. And uh, it is cat categorized in the danger category as per EPA. Warning, it's not safe for environment and may damage uh, the surfaces where it is being used, not safe for people, can have uh, eye irritation or skin irritation. Pre-cleaning is not recommended because it's a good cleaning agent, but as a protocol, we will do it. And hence, since it is not safe for human being, we have to take all uh, precautions as far as PPE is concerned. Next slide. So here with this graphic representation, I want to show you that this virus, what we are fighting now, uh, then, then is bacterial spores, then bacteria and fungi in this chart. So if you see this virus uh, here, now the group of chemistry is given here. So high penetration of these chemistries, which is shown here and uh, Certain chemistries can have this just peripheral effect. Certain can act on the capsids, which is protein cell of virus, enclosing genetic material. And certain compounds can have effect on the DNA part of the virus. Similarly, we need to see the bacterial spores portion. So here in bacterial spores, what happens that there is a spore coat, outer coat. And then after that, there is cortex. And then is the core. So up to core level penetration, formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde, or hydrogen peroxide, they have. But other chemistries, they have either up to cortex or up to coat level. That's why bacterial spores, uh, as far as disinfectants are concerned, there is limitation. So similar program is there. You can see uh, the different chemistries. I can share this slide with all participants. This is very useful. So while you make the program, so target um, microorganism, when you are selecting, you should see this chart and 
make your program select your disinfectant accordingly next slide please so finally uh, as a recap what you need to see before you select the disinfectant kill claims what they claim whether it is there or not fast kill time and wet contact time these two things are important and it must you must ensure that proper disinfection it does responsible in the sense of human care and environment care ease of use convenience for our technician for his, our staff and cost factor because we all are in the business so cost matters a lot other local factors can be there that also you need to consider regulatory aspect and then uh, the situation in which you are next slide so quickly uh, i am not discussing sterilization today just these are the sterilizations uh, which are being used steam sterilization flash sterilization very little difference between steam and flash flash is attempted as if any equipment has to be used immediately after sterilization that is covered under flash sterilization then you have got low temperature sterilizations like com most common is ethylene oxide gas sterilization now hydrogen peroxide gas plasma sterilization is also in use in usa and parasitic acid sterilization is also new addition so the, these are the sterilization process which we can cover in the advanced module next but our business will not come from sterilization our business in public places will come from disinfection service so in us it's a, at a developed stage as far as disinfectant chemistry is concerned disinfection process is concerned so they have been reviewing i will just give you two examples that formaldehyde alcohol combination have been deleted uh, as uh, recommended for sterilants or high level disinfectant because of irritating nature and the there is ppt is not there aji so they are reviewing this from time to time and uh, that's why there if you see the epa site epa website or fda website you will find lot of chemistries and uh, lot of development is there going forward because it will be used in great extent and it will be extended uh, in different countries regulators will have eye on the uses of disinfection so since we are entering into this regime now we should be careful next slide so site assessment uh, and this is disinfection plan you should understand your enemy that is microbes you should select suitable disinfectant protect yourself use ppes educate your customers because they are also unaware about the process and the chemistry and sop as it will be discussed in the next session has to be followed and keep records so to conclude the selection of disinfectant is most critical aspect in disinfection process and hence we should be alert and we should be quite methodical while selecting disinfectant thanks for your attention now i will introduce this uh, session speakers so these were the reference back slide so uh, next uh, speakers are uh, they will talk on the application techniques for various public places sops and it, this will be jointly presented by mr rajan prakash and mr rajdeep kumar rajan is from pest go go products and services private limited india rajan is an agriculture graduate and has done masters in business management from rajasthan university jaipur he has 25 year plus experience managed key leadership role in major pest control companies in india and abroad he is a certified lead auditor of for iso 22000 rajneesh is an expert in fumigation pest management agri commodity storage production and preservation he has more than 18 year experience in related industries he has led several top ranking companies in the field of pest management fumigation agri warehousing and system consulting form in his previous assignment at middle and senior management level 
Thanks for your attention. Over to you, Rajan and Rajneesh, for your next session. Thank you. Good morning and a warm welcome to all. And thank you, Mr. Ojwal, for your kind introduction. My name is Rajan Prakash. And now, for your seamless experience, I'll stop this video and start my PPT. This was just to show my face. Now I'll start my PPT. Okay, so here we start. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expect it to change, but the realist adjust the same. This timeless quote from William A. Ward is so relevant today, because if there was ever a time to be realist, it is now. Let's define new norms and create new normals. On a lighter note, as Winston Churchill said, if you are going through hell, keep going. So relevant, no? We all want to pass this phase ASAP. In the midst of all this corona chaos, I see tremendous opportunities as well. We all know them. Can you list some of the opportunities? Yes, of course. So I thank UPL management to provide this wonderful platform to share, interact, and learn. In the present situation, there is huge demand for disinfection service from every walks of life. As our elite panelists have already set the tone with basics of disinfectant, biology, selection of disinfectants, and now I'm going to discuss SOPs. So, here is the agenda of my discussion. The success of disinfection will largely depend upon how well you do the COVID-19 risk assessment. So, here we'll be discussing about the coronavirus risk analysis, goal, process versus performance goal uh, that we have to take for disinfection service, coordination, which is very important for this service, roles and responsibilities let's fix the roles and responsibility for the success planning planning has to be there and then good execution then evaluation and downtime and then preventive maintenance routine some of these parts will be taken care by rajneesh so let's move on so coronavirus risk analysis there is nine step process for this risk assessment which i am going to present in my next slide as a service Please. professional, we do it for all of our clients, like food factories, hotels, other factories, offices, condominiums, farm houses, bungalows. I'm sure you will agree with me that without risk analysis, we should not be doing disinfection service directly. So let's go through each step of the risk assessment. So defense against virus, how strong is the entry barrier for infected person? What are the immediate touch points when somebody tries to enter into a premises? What are the high traffic areas? Who are the staff doing critical tasks? Who are the staff handling critical equipments? Who are the staff posted at critical areas? Slides are not showing. Sir, sir, slide, slide, please share your slide. Okay. Hold on. Sir, you have to start from beginning. Okay. Yes, start from origin. Can you see the slide? Yeah, yes, now. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so I'm afraid I'll have to restart. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, you have to. Okay, so I'll skip some part of the introduction which I did. I'll move on to agenda part. Okay, so it is visible to all? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So here's the agenda of my discussion. 
the success of disinfection will largely depend upon how well you do the covid-19 risk assessment so we will be discussing about corona virus risk analysis goal we will have to set goal process versus performance goal we have to ensure there is good coordination then we have to fix up roles and responsibility for better success we have to get into planning we have to execute clinically then we have to evaluate downtime should be there and then we will talk about preventive maintenance routine so some of these slides will be shared by my colleague rajnish so we move on to next slide about risk analysis so there is nine step process for this risk assessment which i am going to present in the next slide coming slide as a service professional we do it for all our clients like food factories hotel even other factories offices condominiums farm houses bungalows i am sure you will agree with me that without risk analysis we should not be doing disinfection service directly all right so here are the nine step how we do corona virus risk assessment so first step is we have to ensure we have to check how good is the defense system against virus how strong is the entry barrier for infected person we have to see what all immediate touch points are there when you enter into the premises which are the high traffic area who all are the staff doing critical tasks who all the staff which are who are handling critical equipments who are the staff posted at critical areas then we move on to next step list who are at higher risk and how like employees at higher risk level would be as per their age as per their pre existing medical condition people can be suffering with asthma fever throat infection they may be diabetic they may be having high bp so we have to uh make sure we go through all these details then we move on to next step so we Hello. get some we get some clue from first two points now we have to assess the risk and control them so some people might have to work from home we have to decide about use of pp we have to consult disinfection experts so then we move on to fourth step which is record your finding now we have to develop a method statement well now some might have question what is method statement well it will be step by step instruction to be followed by employees visitors contractors etc i'll also be talking about number of formats which we might have to maintain like service reports planning sheet a uh, disposal sheet stock sheet etc etc then we complete the review you know in view of risk your overall own operational sop different fa food factories different uh, establishment will have their own sop so you know because now there will be new normal because of all this pandemic so you have to you might have to review your sop and then circulate the revise the sop then you have to manage risk specific to your business like what kind of visitors vendors clients they come in your trade whether they are domestic international whether you deal in school kids old age for example many of my indian fellows will understand recall the case of ceasefire company of noida where an auditor coming from uk became the biggest risk and source of covid-19 infection since the risk was not understood it created big problem for entire country then we move on to next step pp personal protection equipment now we need to understand right quality procurement how we do that training donning and doffing of the pp when to use limitations of pp there can be a limitation of pp we have to explain them as well how to dispose pp how to clean disinfect and maintain pp 
uh, right quality of PPE, Mr. Rajneesh will be speaking in details. Like the PPE packet should be vacuum sealed. It should have Velcro and not chipped. A lot of PPE's company I see, they are boasting that their PPE has zipper. Do you know that is not safe? I'll share link from WHO, which clearly defines the PP material should be tear resistant, puncture resistant, abrasive resistant, tested for seam strength. They should be punched and not stitched. All right. So we next to we move to next step. What if any of your staff gets affected with coronavirus? Create. You have to create policies for this, providing additional PP, maybe. Consult disinfection experts in all these situation, of course. You might have to think about locking down your business temporarily. You might have to inform local authorities, police, etc. Okay. So now we'll be talking about goal. How should we set our goal in this entire operation for success, successful disinfection? So a goal properly set is half reached. So let's see how we can design and set a realistic goal. So let's see what process goal should we design, which will lead us to performance goal. Right? So what are the process goals? Remove, reduce, or destroy pathogen. Of course, it has to be cost-effective manner. We have to employ appropriate method. Timely and effective operation has to be ensured. So all these process goals will always be under our complete control and we have to focus on them. If we focus on them, we achieve the performance goal. What are the performance goals? Define an agreed process, instill confidence in the customer's mind, comply to federal, state and local laws, result pre and post count. Here I would just like to mention that swap count method is cumbersome and takes time. With UPL, we are trying to get some new technologies which are already available in developed countries. So we might come back to you in our advanced session. Next. So coordination leads to successful, successful operation. Let's understand what kind of coordination is required for our operation. So a good coordination leads to successful operation. Coordination is a thorough conviction that nobody can get there unless everybody gets there. In other words, if you are not coordinated, then you never know where that bruise came from. All right. So this is simple matrix. Who coordinates with whom? Like, for example, location, date, and time. You have to coordinate with logistics section. Facility access, technician numbers, you have to coordinate with operation section. Organize men and material movement, you have to again coordinate with logistics section. Disposal process, you have to coordinate with disposal section. Vehicle entry, movement, control checkpoints with logistic group. You have to ensure that entire process goes smooth, then also you have to coordinate well with the top management of the client. So, what is the most common challenge which we face in practical and real scenario? Please think all those issues that you face or you have experienced as service provider or as a customer. I'm aware that in our audience today, we have pest control managers, we have hotel customers, we have food factory customers, we have facility management customers. So please write it somewhere on your paper. Share with us on chat box. Please remain muted, but write it on chat box. Mr. Raja Mahendran will definitely share few experiences written by you at the end of the session. I'm sure everyone will definitely have a thing or two to share. I will wait here for 10 seconds so that everyone shares here. Go on, I'm waiting. Please write on chat box. I can see few people writing. All right. So 
let's discuss few goof ups you know which you will easily relate to example one can be the team you finalize and the team reach at the site they're not the same they have swept without asking you isn't that the big mistake now second issue someone has reached but he doesn't have access pass because somebody goofed up third case someone is not just trained and he reached over there to carry out the job so you have to anticipate these challenges and ensure that there is no goof up so how do we ensure that there are certain do's and don'ts which you have to define for your own organization i have just given few hints but you have to define your own do's and don'ts like ppe check you have to check ppe before using train the people supervise correct way of donning and doffing you should have complete set of documentation as per sop you should check the equipment power supply should be checked you should adhere to sops and protocols and what are the don'ts don't deviate from your given creed uh, don't allow unauthorized person don't by bypass from a scanning or temperature check don't move in hot or warm zone without pp okay so let's move on to next slide so what are rules and responsibility which will ensure that we don't have goof ups and we do it completely professionally so there should be clearly defined roles that are more important to team work than clearly defined work all right so these are simple set of roles to be assigned to suitable member of team like who arranges site entry access pass movement pass who keeps constant touch that there is no last minute surprises who coordinates closely with the logistic section who coordinates disinfection team activities with other ongoing response activities at the site so that no last minute goof ups there can be some senior person at the site and he doesn't allow you to do the job and your entire uh, process plan goes for a toss who supervises and maintain disinfection station quarantine premises control checkpoints and decontamination stations so the disinfection manager supervises activities of all technicians assists with bio security and its intermediary between all groups so planning let's discuss planning i know it's monologue from my side in this kind of non stage setting it's less interactive but you know what the more you write on chat box i'll be more connected to you what should be the part of planning for disinfection service please write on chat box i'm looking forward to incorporate your inputs into the sop that we are going to prepare for the benefit of all i'll be waiting here for 5 seconds so that everyone writes in the chat box i think the chat box is going to blast today next go to the next slide so according to me the most important cogs of planning will are these five i'm sure i'm going to get some more cues from your responses so these are simple action plan we have to create time frame we have to adopt the procedure we have to refer to sop we have to do the team selection balance team then we have to decide on chemical and equipments A lot of inputs are already given by mr ujwal kumar and then regarding the equipment mr r sundar raj will be giving you lot of inputs so execution part extremely important for assessment of a site the important factors are premise type criticality ventilation environmental challenges area small versus large target pathogen do i miss anything maybe please 
send your input. So, how do we decide that how many technicians are required? Of course, area, if it is large area, we might require more number of technicians. Sanitary condition, yes. If the sanitary condition is not good, the requirements would be high. Time frame, if the time frame is very short, challenging, then we might require higher number of person. Complexity of operation, if it is complex like hospital situation, then we might have to involve larger number of technician. Expertise, the more the expertise, the more the training, the more the skill set, we might manage with lesser number of technician. Now, evaluation and downtime, both are very important aspects. From here on, my dear colleague Rajneesh Kumar will present. His introduction has been already given by Mr. Ujwal. Rajneesh had been working with me since last 20 years, and we get along so well. So welcome, Rajneesh. For five seconds, please show your face, and then I will change slides for you. Before signing off, I just want to say, Good question informs, great question transforms. So guys, thank you. And I'm looking forward for your queries, feedbacks. Thank you. Rajnis, please start video and then I'll change PPT for you. Here you go. Thanks, Mr. Ujjal, Mr. Rajan, for a nice introduction and, and uh, inviting me for the presentation. Good afternoon, participants who are joining from India and other parts of the world. So I'll be taking up uh, evaluation, downtime of this disinfection services. So uh, can I have these slides? Yes. Yeah, please put it in presentation mode. Yes, it is. Go ahead. So, uh, as uh, Mr. Rajan discussed about goals, coordination, roles and responsibilities, different do's and don'ts related with the disinfection services. So, I'll be taking up the evaluation part, the downtime for the disinfection services. So, uh, it's very important. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, before no audio, sir, please unmute your audio. Rajni, sir, please unmute your audio. Yeah, please please unmute your am I audible audio? now? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, the uh, before commencing our works, it's very important that we go for thorough assessment of the premise because every premise has got certain complexities and it needs to be uh, studied, it needs to be assessed because working with uh, food industry or hospitality or hospital segments. So we have to define certain critical areas. The need for the services are more. We need to define the zones. Now, the second thing we have to define, which are the areas where this disinfection services are required and uh, the pre-cleaning as it has been discussed with uh, uh, much uh, care in our previous presentation that all disinfection services are very effective if the area has been pre-cleaned because it will reduce a lot of uh, microbial load and it will have the dis disinfectant uh, working more properly for the viruses and the microorganisms that we are talking of. Uh, we need to figure out the areas where we need to put our uh, um, equipments, materials, the disinfectants, uh, where we have to park our vehicles or the requirements 
for the personnel that uh, are going to do the services, the equipments that we need to put there. As uh, in, in disinfectant being dealt uh, in detail by Mr. Ujjwal, it's very important that we have to select the approved and appropriate disinfect, disinfect uh, for the premise for hard surface or for certain other areas where you need not to charge the air, some cleaning or some uh, soil will do. So based on the requirement, we need to select the different kind of disinfectant. What would be our procedure? Sometimes it's not required that you always charge the air uh, in the disinfection services. You're simply uh, mopping the area or just uh, uh, a cleaning that area will do the uh, needful. So we have to devise the pro procedure for the disinfection services. The requirement of the technicians uh, are uh, need to be studied because uh, sometimes their skill set has to be figured out whether they are trained for the services, whether they know about the safety protocols as charted out in the organizations. Uh, so, if needed, then we have to go for just in uh, training for the uh, right uh, the work. So, these are certain things that needs to be planned. Materials, supplies, equipment that we'll be bringing in. Uh, next important is what's the federal law? What are the uh, regulations prevailing in that particular area? Uh, what are the disinfectant which are approved? What are the disinfectant which are rejected by the regulatory authorities there? So we need to remain compliant with the uh, law of that land. Uh, it's very important that while doing our work, we need to be aware about the disposal of excess of the disinfectant because see, these are chemical and anyway, they are going to damage certain or they are going to have some environmental impact. So we need to be very vigilant on that aspect quality assurance and quality control of what are our objectives, whether we are able to fulfill that, the uh, objective of killing microorganisms, reducing the load of microbes from that area, the contact time, uh, the nature of the disinfectant is a broader spectrum. What is the time factor in which it start bringing the efficacy? So, these are the points that we need to plan before commencing our works. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, we discussed about uh, assessment of the premise. So uh, in premise, we have to figure out like which are the appropriate uh, sites where uh, we can do our disinfection services. So uh, three, uh, two criteria are very important that it should have a minimal uh, and adequate drainage as per state, local, and federal level. You can't start... Uh, doing your job in an area where uh, chemicals are going to uh, uh, have adverse effect on the flora and fauna in that area. So we need to have a, a, a proper assessment that which are the areas where we can do the services with having a minimal environmental impact. Sometimes it's very important that uh, external areas needs to be dis disinfected also, like uh, fences are important for disinfections. Uh, internal areas, it may differ from industry to industry. Sometimes your chopping board is very important. Sometimes the conveying lines are important. These needs to be assessed before commencing our works. Uh, the environmental risk uh, uh, for outdoor disinfection is very important. If you, have, if you have a pond nearby or if you have some fish culture nearby, so whether you're disinfectant, if you are charging the air, so Finally, is going to land on the uh, flora and fauna of the region. If it is causing some adverse effect on them, then that's something we need to uh, assess or we have to do disinfection of that area or we have to devise some other methods. We 
need to define uh, different areas within the premise like hot zone cold zone warm zone so hot zone and warm zones are typically the areas where any personal move is moving uh, with having personal protective equipment uh, he need to have other vehicles and other things be contaminated in a some marked zone area so adequately we need to do such kind of segregation inside the premise next next slide please hello hello i am unable yeah. to see the this is being slides my, yeah okay is it there yeah so a uh, different segregated zone is being shown in this slide so it is a typical uh, one factory location hello. where hello got... i am unable to see the slides haji it is visible sir query only on chat don't unmute yeah. yourself please yes so uh, in particular this slide we have one establishment where we are trying to show the different zones that we have created inside our factory premise so uh, we have hot zone the warm zone is where vehicles and other personnel are moving uh, the cold zone is just next to the receptions so or Uh, at front of the uh, factory so uh, this kind of segregation is very important if you are talking about disinfection services in a broader aspect next slide please next very important part is the net you manpower so uh, the manpower uh, which are deputed for the service Should have required a skill set with him. Whether he understand the disinfection services, whether he understand the safety protocols of the areas, we need to figure out that those technicians they really they have that skill set which matches our required. Uh, they uh, need to be trained, and the frequency of their training is very important. They need to have a Now the organization trained in this survey. Their training requirement and verification of credentials are very much required. As I explained earlier, that just uh, before commencing the job, sometimes it's required that they need just-in-time training also. So uh, we don't have to hesitate in providing that kind of training uh, at this time because it's very important. They are dealing with uh, the chemicals and disinfectant, and as we understood. Uh, from our uh, previous presentation that all the uh, chemical and disinfectant sometimes it may be harmful to the people also so he should be proper aware with the personal protective equipment he should be properly aware with the uh, safety protocols of that area next slide please i'll be talking about personal protective equipment uh, we are hearing nowadays that uh, having sub standard uh, uh, kind of personal protective equipments available in the market uh, and uh, uh, there are uh, many adverse effects because of that uh, when we are dealing with uh, such kind of disinfection services dealing with uh, disinfectants so obviously we need to remain safe ourselves so uh, there has to be a proper uh, specifications and we name it uh, for uh, the corona warriors who are fighting against this uh, uh, corona virus so they need to remain same you know safe uh, the requirements are uh, they should uh, be trained for these personal protective equipment they know they should know that how to uh, gear up themselves with these personal protective equipments the PPE that we are providing that needs to be tested. They uh, have a proper size for according to the measurements of the technicians, and that needs to be certified. The uh, they uh, should uh, be trained in a proper manner in which they should don this uh, personal protective equipment. 
that should fit properly to them. It should not be loose or hanging kind of thing. Like we are providing these personal protective equipment that while they are air charging or while they are dealing with the disinfectant, those disinfectants should not come in contact with the skin or something. So they need a proper uh, training. Uh, they need to have a proper certified kit with them. The third most important part that while coming out of the areas, uh, they should be clear that they are uh, bringing uh, some kind of contaminants or some kind of microbes uh, with them to outside world. So before coming out, they need to get decontaminated also. So this needs to be insured for uh, uh, corona variants. So uh, these personal protective equipment is a very important part of uh, the team. Next, next slide. Uh, what what should be the uh, specifications of proper uh, specifications for personal protective equipment? How we can find out that this uh, particular PP is paid? Uh, uh, the main criteria is that we can define that the thickness, minimum thickness should be 90 plus. There should be vacuum seal. Uh, in uh, standard personal protective equipment, they're not the stitched. They are punched. They should be abrasive resistant. Uh, the other thing, they uh, they are uh, equipped with uh, Velcro above the zippers. I mean, it's not that the zippers are in open. Uh, they are vacuum packed. So uh, while you are opening it, you can figure out the kit that you are given, whether that's the vacuum packed or not, uh, because if it's not not that, then uh, there are chances that it's of substandard. Uh, uh, the GSM thickness is very uh, necessary because as we know that many of the disinfectant, they bring some uh, uh, irritant. Uh, they are irritants. They cause some irritations on your skin and these things. So these uh, personal protective equipment should be of ideal thickness to prevent the user from such kind of disinfectant. Next slide, please. So, uh, as discussed, the uh, PPE parameters should be like they should be tear resistant. They should not get, uh, uh, I mean, they should uh, not get destroyed by some sort of. Uh, uh, operations or these things, they should be puncture resistant. Seams should be strong enough. Uh, they should be sterilized and vacuum packed. Thickness should be 90 plus GSM. Uh, there should be a Velcro over their zippers. Next slide. So quality assurance of the work is very important. Uh, the service technician who has done the service, whether that was trained on the procedure or not, uh, whether the desired objective is uh, achieved or not. So while selecting disinfectant, while selecting the procedure, the final aim is that the particular area where we are doing the service, that should have a low microbial load. So we need to have a desired contact time and concentration achieved. So the quality parameters we need to define for uh, specific industries, it may differ because like if you're talking of some advanced stages, then probably we'll have a system where management tools may be defined for a different industry or what would be the safe microbial load for uh, doing your operations. So a quality control as set by the organization, as set by the industries has to be met with the disinfection services. So proper validation of the work is very necessary. Next. Next slide, please. We talk of uh, disinfection mixing. So uh, anybody who is going for the mixing of the disinfectant, he should wear personal protective equipment. It's not that 
during the services only he'll be at the personal protective equipment because any kind of exposure is uh, not good even uh, some of the disinfectant if it's uh, not harmful to the human being but uh, as a standard uh, operating procedure he need to wear personal protective equipment while mixing uh, the disinfectant we have to be uh, sure that uh, the disinfectant that we are talking about is within the shelf life and we need to check the product label for expiration date um, the calculation of the disinfectant or a particular area will depend upon the uh, desired concentration uh, per square feet or other metrics that we set let's say if i talk of 1 liter of diluted uh, disinfectant is required to cover 25 to 40 square feet so all the wall surface ceiling surface everything needs to be calculated so basis mr. that we need Rajneesh, to calculate mr rajneesh you have 2 minutes now okay yeah i'll do that so based on that he need to calculate the uh, disinfectant and uh, then required disinfectant needs to be mixed and it needs to be air charged or it needs to be spread in that area next next slide please so all high touch points uh, which have a high microbial load needs to be uh, uh, sprayed or needs to be charged with the disinfectant uh, site specific plan uh, needs to be uh, done a customized procedure needs to be developed we need to cover all, all high touch areas proper disposal of high quantity of disinfectant which is there needs to be disposed of next slide so downtime begins once we have the disinfection services certified i mean uh, uh, we just clear the area and we say that disinfection services has been done as per the quality protocol that we have developed swab control is a time consuming area we are trying to get some of the equipments with the help of upl so that we can make it very fast next post uh, disinfection services is that our uh, objective that we wanted to get whether it's been covered or not all contaminated area has been identified and is been treated properly some of the things or some of the areas which are uh, not uh, disinfected we need to figure out and we need to devise certain plan other plans how to disinfect that areas the necessary contact of disinfectant uh, was uh, permitted all the areas being properly disinfected and finally the effluent from the disinfectant being discharged safely or not next preventive maintenance after this disinfection services we need to chart out the different uh, measures like uh, the results that we are getting so that needs to be defined in a success i mean uh, ensuing month or weeks how to do it on a regular basis what would be the disinfection fre frequency and uh, logging all the details service documentations are very important sampling testing frequency needs to be defined next so uh, this was all uh, from my side now i'll be introducing next speaker mr sundaraj is from upl limited uh, mr sundaraj has over 27 years of experience in the pest management industry and has worked in several multinational locations across asia and africa in the public health sector domain he was associated with pca now rentocle pca for 25 years and now heading upl's public health product division at entire south asia southeast asia and east african market over 20 countries from 2018 onwards it is my pleasure to invite mr sundaraj for the next presentation thank you thank you very much Thank you, Rajesh, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, I think you've got to go to the first slide. Sir, so good afternoon. Yeah. Visible, but you have come to the last slide. So now is the last slide. You got to come from the first slide. Yes. Make it full. 
Okay. Uh, good afternoon, friends from the industry, and uh, now uh, rather good evening for the friends from East Asia. And uh, for the seamless experience, what I do is I'll uh, switch off my video, and then I'll continue my presentation in the audio mode. Okay. Thank you. Now today. I'll be uh, taking you through the uh, various equipments suitable to carry out disinfection services. Their selection, because you cannot really use all the equipment which is available in the space. We got to select the right equipment for the right uh, application purpose. And then the usage pattern inside and outside the premises and their, their regular maintenance. So you are aware that choosing the right equipment is equally important, like choosing the right chemistry for any disinfection work, be it for that matter, even for the pest management also, you require a right equipment for the right application. So over here in disinfection, you need to really choose the right equipment for a right application. So with the right choice of application equipments, we can actually focus on applying the right dose of chemistry on all the target area with minimal wastages so that we can complete each and every job without messing up the customer premises. This is a new line of services. Your customer expectation may be different and your actual delivery may be different. So we got to really choose the right equipment which relieves the right dose of chemistry on the target surfaces. And then uh, at the end of the uh, treatment, we should not end up polluting the areas also. So without polluting the area and with leaving the right dose of chemistry, and then also we should avoid unnecessary contact or unnecessary exposure to the non-target areas. And then we should end up delivering a real value to the end customer. So all these points I'll be covering up in this particular presentation. Next slide. Ajay, next one. Next slide. So in this particular presentation, I'll take you through uh, various equipments which is available in the space now. And then most importantly, we should know how to choose them. So I'll share you the knowledge related to what are the criteria, selection criteria for selecting the right various uh, right equipment among the various equipments which is available here. And then I will take you through the uh, disinfection works on indoor as well as on the outdoor premises. In addition, I will also take you through one particular process in which uh, equipment which can be suitable for disinfection as well as for sterilization works. Lastly, you, I mean, most of you know that UPL is dealing with this range of ULV sprayers in this particular space. So I will be giving out a detail related to the range of sprayers what we are dealing from UPL Limited. Right, next slide. So, uh, the moment you just Google sprayers near desktop, you see uh, loads of search results. So, but uh, you cannot really use all, or you cannot use only one, because there is no single equipment which can do a multiple disinfection work, because the target areas for disinfections are varied. So if you look at the target area, uh, there are various uh, touch points. So if you look at it, uh, door touch points, you have a uh, door handle, you have uh, the workstations, like you have on the top of the table, you have a uh, dining table area, and then you have uh, board room areas and all this, and then on top of the chair as well. There are many touch points in which we need to really apply our disinfectant. So there is no single equipment which can do a job for multiple areas. So we got to really choose a right equipment for application to the right areas. And then what are the key parameters we should follow in choosing the right equipment? See, first, is, first and foremost is we should decide what is the target application area. As I just detailed, there are many touch points. See, now this coronavirus is spreading from human to human. So uh, uh, infected person will be really uh, spreading that in the uh, office, office area or a public space. So in which if he is touching that particular door knob, if he is carrying this particular coronavirus in his body or be that for that matter, any microbe on his body, he can really transfer it to the other host. So the touch points has to be focused. Based on the various touch points, we need to choose the right equipment. Right. And then uh, as uh, Ujwal and other speakers have uh, explained, the contact time 
the contact time of the disinfectant is really important because you cannot just apply a disinfectant and expect uh, that to really perform immediately. It requires to have a, a continuous a kind of an exposure period, minimum exposure period in which we can control, you can control the target microbe. So before choosing the right equipment, you got to really under, under read from the label, from the product label, and understand what are the exposure period or a contact time required for that particular disinfectant to be available on the treated surface, right? So that contact time is also a key parameter. And any equipment should not be a cumbersome uh, process. It should be easy for application and it should be applicator friendly. The person who is on the front line should be finding it uh, really uh, easy to apply this particular disinfectant using the equipments. And the uh, uh, disinfectant what we choose, the equipment has to really leave an optimum dosage of disinfectant onto the target application area, right? And uh, so uh, this particular business is a, a new emerging business. And then once uh, we have a clarity about this vaccine development and other thing, the requirement for this particular business may really get reduced, but it not, will not completely go away. It will get reduced. So the investment, what you have done on the equipments, you have to really think of investing on equipment which can do a multiple job. You should do a job which is regularly sustaining, uh, so to support your regular sustaining business. Your regular sustaining business could be a regular disinfestation services, or it could be mosquito control businesses, or it could become other spray services. So when you are investing on an equipment, you should really look at the usage factor, it, whether it can be used only for disinfection or it can be used for multiple purposes so that you make an informed decision on the investment on the equipment, right? So mostly people only look at the price because of the availability of uh, uh, products from East Asia and availability of products from across the globe. So people only look out for the price. Price alone is not the only criteria to consider. We have to really look at the build quality. If the build quality is good, it is an investment you are making. If you are not looking at the build quality, we are only looking at only six months of usage or three months of usage. But if you look at uh, the other expenses, indirect expenses, there will be, there will be too many indirect expenses. So look out for not only a direct expenses, you also look out for indirect expense. And then the ease of maintenance, because there are machineries which follows a cumbersome uh, maintenance process. We should really select a, a machinery, which is uh, very easy for us to really uh, fix any issues and fix any kind of maintenance issues also. And then we should we end up importing a lot of uh, products abroad from abroad, and then we don't have any kind of service backup even the service engineer locally doesn't have any kind of a knowledge. And then people don't, the distributors don't uh, end up uh, investing on the spare parts. So we have to really look at all this parameter before we choose the right equipment. Some of the equipments are very uh, uh, cheap enough for you to really afford, but some of the equipments are a bit costly. But don't worry, when you are investing on a costly machine, you are actually investing for your regular business also, because they are going to do a multiple job. Right. Next slide. So when you look at uh, the disinfection equipments for indoor use, you would have seen around eight uh, machines uh, here. So if you look at it, uh, I mean, you would have seen uh, most of you are really carrying only one equipment into the uh, indoor area. Mostly for pest managers, we are called in by our private customers to do the disinfection services mostly indoor. For outdoor area, municipal corporation and other public bodies, our health ministry is doing it. For indoor area, there are only two players, owners, uh, facility manager, or indoor cleaning staff, or it should be a professional like you. So for a professional like you, you should really go with a, a range of equipments. It's not that only with the backpack spray. I've seen a lot of uh, our own uh, uh, I mean, friends from the industry are carrying only the sprayers, backpack sprayer, and they are carrying the backpack misters also. No, they will not do a complete job which you are wanting to do. Right. You got to have a range of equipment. Say, for example, it could be a hand sprayer, or it could be a hand compression sprayer, or it could be a battery operated, it could be a battery operated uh, sprayer, or on the uh, right last, uh, you have a battery operated mister. Right. At the bottom, you have a ULV fogger first, and second is also a ULV fogger, and third is a, a first two are electrical operated one, and then the third one is the uh, battery operated ULV fogger. 
Right. I need to really caution you. Uh, many are inquiring about a battery operated uh, fogger. Yes, they are really useful in terms of applying the disinfectant, but in terms of durability, they last only for about six months period. And then in terms of the reach of the droplets, they reach only to around six feet or 10 feet level. They don't really dispense the droplets to a desired area of our application, right? So instead of uh, investing on a uh, machinery which is going to last for only six months, you should look out for equipment which can last for years together. And then the last and then important one is a P2LB, an important machine from Brazil. And uh, that's the one which can really do a job both indoor as well as outdoor. So, uh, I mean, if I talk about this, uh, I've shown you around eight different ones. In terms of class, if you look at it, there are three different class here. One is the uh, sprayer with the hand compression sprayer. And second is the backpack sprayer. And third is a ULB. All three are, the three categories are for three different applications into the disinfection area. I will, next slide, uh, Haji, next slide. So in terms of target application area, so these sprayers, the three categories of sprayers are going into a different areas of application. If you look at it, see, uh, the human touch points are mostly the chairs and then tables and the workstations where you have inside the offices. The uh, photo on the left, on the top left, is a reception area of an office. In the reception area, the uh, the most touch, touch, touch points are chairs. If you look at that, you cannot really use a, uh, 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 the backpack sprayer on top of the uh, chair. Because on the top of the chair, you require a minimal quantity. You don't require a huge quantity. So use a hand compression sprayer or a hand sprayer so that the right dosage of disinfectant is applied there. And then you can use uh, wiping, or light, and then you can also do the other disinfection activity here. Right. Mere spraying alone on these surfaces will leave the residues. So you've got to do, additionally, after the spraying, you've got to do the wiping. Probably. And uh, see, uh, with the backpack sprayer, the backpack sprayer does the disinfection uh, application onto the uh, solid surfaces, like uh, onto the wall flow junction if you want to do it, or if you want to do it in the area where there is a microbial load there on the... The microbial load is there on the inanimate uh, uh, objects, you thus can be used. So, these two cannot do a complete job because you look at the sofa there in the reception area. The sofa here is could be a leather or leatherette, or it could be a, a cushion, or, I mean, a fabric based cushion. On those areas, you cannot use the hand compression sprayer. There, you got to use the ULV fogger because the ULV fogger. Once you dispense the droplets on the surface, they will be suspended in the air for about 20 minutes. And then once they fall down, they fall down onto the uh, sofa and other horizontal uh, spaces down below. They also do the disinfection. So here, if you look at it, and uh, on the right-hand side bottom, you will see a picture in which all the workstation target areas are focused. On the target area, if you look at it, it could be uh, armrest of the chair, or it could be uh, on the top of the workstation here, or it could be the other touch points here also. Now, now uh, those hand compression sprayers are useful onto the local disinfection works, whereas the ULV sprayers are useful for a large area disinfection works. If you look at the ULV foggers here, they uh, pump out the uh, droplets, and the disinfectant and the droplet form are pumped out to a distance of around 60 feet if you look at the right uh, top one that is P2LV, that goes up to 60 feet uh, horizontally and then 40 feet vertically. If you look at that yellow machine in the center, that goes out to around 36 feet horizontally and 26 feet vertically. So they pumps out the disinfectant to the distance of around 36 feet or 60 feet according to the machine what you choose. And then they end up disinfecting all the uh, fabric or uh, you, most of the offices, modern offices, we have Venetian blanket. Venetian blinds are protecting us from the sunlight, unless unnecessary sunlight and other things is protected by the Venetian blind. And then we have uh, screen guards, a lot of screen guards. And then we have a uh, uh, lot of, uh, uh, what are they, uh, I mean, um, clock based one, uh, or a lot of uh, the leather based one. Those area and the top surfaces and the horizontal surfaces can be cleaned or can be disinfected with our ULV fogger. 
So combination of the three products, if you look at it, first is the hand compression sprayer for local disinfection, second is the backpack one, the backpack alone, I've seen a lot of test managers carrying only the backpack one, backpack alone will not do a complete job, right? Because if you look at the pre-count and the post-count, you will not have an appreciable uh, difference in the count, microbial count. So you've got to have a three different range of equipments to do an indoor application, disinfection application works, right? And then you must be missing one equipment here, the one equipment which uh, people are getting confused whether it is suitable for sterilization or whether it is suitable for uh, disinfection. I'll detail that in the next slide. Next slide, please. So the equipments what you see on the right hand side, these two are cold field nebulizer, fantastic products and uh, they are most suitable for sterilization purpose for the reason the, the ULV nozzle is fitted on the top of the body. And here the uh, droplet size are in the range of around 5 micron to 20 micron level. They are too tiny. And then when they settle in, they got to settle in with the loads of droplets so that they have a good disinfection activity on the treated surfaces, right? In the offices or in the, uh, uh, I mean, a regular commercial area, customer is not expecting you to do a sterilization. So, as usual is clearly told you, sterilization is a deeper form of a disinfection that is required only for a critical area. It is not required for all the area. All the commercial buildings are not requiring a sterilization. So sterilization is required for a critical healthcare area and sterilization is required in the uh, sensitive packaging area like when you're packaging the food material or when you're packaging medical equipment and in those places, you require uh, the sterilization uh, aseptic uh, location. So for ASEPT, achieving a aseptic location, you got to have these kind of an equipment which will pump in the droplets for about minimum two hours or three hours and then you really leak, uh, what do they load that particular area with the desired quantity of disinfectant. But this one, uh, I mean, you can have it, but in terms of if you really count uh, the pre-count and then post-count, if you do it, you may not really achieve a good results with only the use of these two sprayers. These two players are good, but they are meant mostly for sterilization purposes. Now, here in the picture, you see an operation theta here. In addition to these uh, cold field nebulizer, you find two other equipments here in this uh, place. Why they are used? Because the ULV fogger alone will not be in a position to reach out to the areas under the uh, operation bed area here. So that area has to be covered with the hand compression sprayer. And then the volume flow junction and the door joints and other places we got to use uh, the backpack spray, right? So here also for the sterilization, we require three different equipments. And then I repeat again, sterilization is different. And then equipment required for sterilization is uh, different. And then equipment required for disinfection is different. But this also can do a disinfection job. But for a commercial area, for a larger area, when the customer is not expecting sterilization, why to invest on this kind of machinery? Next slide. Now, uh, we have done uh, uh, treatment into the indoor, right? And customer is also expecting us to do, uh, I mean, he won't expect you to do a, a thorough service on the public area or the common areas outside his building premises, but he will expect you to do a disinfection service to the building periphery areas also, right? Some of you are using the equipment which is there on the right hand side. So the equipment which you see on the right hand side top is uh, in some mist blower. It's not a ULV uh, sprayer. They are mist blower, and then the bottom also what you see is a mist blower. They are basically agriculture sprayer meant for applying the pesticide into the agriculture area. Right? They are not designed for the urban uh, application. So if you look at the mist blower, the droplet range here is from 50 micron to 100 micron level. So the 50 micron to 100 micron level is required for the garden application and for agro application. So when you are choosing this particular equipment, yes, still you can use it. You can use it for the external area. Don't use it for the internal area. Don't use any mist blower for the internal area because when you are using the mist blower for the internal area, they don't stay in the treated air for a long time. They settle down faster. And then when they settle down, they settle down onto the laptop and then desktop computers and then all the uh, papers and other things which is kept on the workstations and uh, these are going and contaminating them also. So we don't need, really need to use a mist blower inside the offices. I repeat, 
Servers are meant for external application, not for internal application. For internal application, only ULB foggers are recommended. So the image blower can be used on the external periphery. Area here, we have to really, we, we don't need to really focus on the area, where there is a direct sun is falling onto the surfaces. So sunlight is having this UV rays, and UV rays is a good that. And then, so we don't need to really uh, spray onto the area, which is exposed to direct sunlight. And then here, the mist blower can be used on the shady areas like or garden there, or if you have surfaces like grass and other places, where you feel that uh, and other people will be frequent, those areas can be treated with the mist blower. But the building periphery, which is next to the uh, door area, next to the common areas, has to be treated with the P2LV, which is a ULV fogger. P2LV is there on the uh, product, and that can be used on the periphery of the uh, building. And then you have a Travisite applicator. This is useful for any facade. You see a lot of fire engines are getting used. Uh, you, when you turn out the news in the TV, you find a lot of fire engines are getting used under all this. Fire engines are pumping out, gushing out a lot of disinfectant. Actually, we don't require that quantity of disinfectant to be applied onto the facade of buildings and all this. You require a sprayer which uses the right dose of disinfectant and achieve results within the minimal usage of the disinfectant. This particular truck-mounted opposite applicator that comes with a flexible tank is sufficient to do any treatment to the building facade. If you have any kind of concern, if a customer is having concern related to the facade cleaning, that particular applicator can be used. So I repeat here, on the right-hand side, what you see are mist blower. Look out for the micron size. When you're buying this particular equipment, look out for the micron size. Micron size here is around 50 micron to 100 micron. Yes, you can use it on the building periphery, but you don't need to use it on the internal inside area where the droplets will fall down and they will really fall down onto the desktop and other sensitive machinery which is kept inside the offices. Right. Moving on to the next one. Right. Now, you see, uh, mostly we don't have calls, uh, get calls from the uh, uh, our customers for this disinfection work, but I thought of really uh, elaborating uh, the application equipments for this also. So on the application equipment, you have variety of equipments available, right? So some are ULB foggers, some are, uh, I mean, uh, normal sprayers, and you have this uh, fire brigade also come, coming and disinfecting also. If you ask me plainly, you don't need to really do a disinfection onto the road surface, which is exposed to the uh, direct sunlight. If it is exposed for more than uh, three hours or more than a day, what is the requirement for disinfecting that particular area? So we don't require uh, disinfection to be done onto the general road side, but disinfection is required. On the pavement, you will be having a lot of uh, chairs. On the pavement side, you will have a little garden. So there, the children, when they are walking by, they will be they will not be really quietly walking by. They will be touching on all the surfaces on the pavement and all this. Those are the area which is frequented by other infected people also. Those area has to be disinfected. That can be disinfected using the top left, the truck mounted lobby siding unit also that can be used for a localized treatment. It uh, comes with around 30 meters of hose tail and then you can uh, effectively spray to 20 meters extra. So around 50 meters of application area can be done. So you can do end up doing a, a, a localized treatment rather than uh, using the disinfectant and spraying it and then wasting the disinfectant unnecessarily. And then you have a tractor mounted dual fogger at the bottom left that is meant for archers and other places. Yes, it is also being used in the public uh, domain uh, and uh, in certain cities you see them uh, really in operation. And yes, they are ULV foggers, they are useful and uh, we can use them in the densely forested area. I cannot say forest, densely uh, uh, the, the places where you have a lot of trees and other places where you want to do the thorough disinfection services, you can use this, right? And then you have on the top right, you have a uh, tractor mounted ULV fogger with around 16 nozzle. This is also this is also basically a farm sprayer. And uh, this particular product is useful for uh, the uh, urban level disinfection also. UPL and uh, CSR activity is deployed around uh, hundreds of these units across India. And uh, we've been helping this municipal corporation in doing this uh, disinfection services into the common areas, right? 
Now at the bottom, you find uh, uh, a champion in this particular trade, uh, a product called Leco. Leco is imported from USA. This particular product is suitable for three different applications. One is it's suitable for disinfection. And second, it is suitable for water management, right? The smell management, water management. And third, it is useful for the mosquito fogging. It employs a technology called pull fogging and it is a champion in this particular ULV fogging technology. Right, next slide. So talking about the uh, capabilities of the machines, what we are dealing from UPL, most of you are using this particular equipment. So I don't need to talk to you much, but for uh, uh, information to the others join us who has joined now, I can really share USP of each of the product. I will not be really reading out everything. I'll be just talking about the USP of this particular product. This is the electric coal field nebulizer. As per the name, you will find it. It is electric operated one. It doesn't operate with the battery and it is a very powerful, it has a very powerful engine of 1400 watt electric motor and uh, this dispenses the droplets to a distance of around 36 feet horizontally and then uh, to a vertical height of around 26 feet vertically. And these are very useful in applying the disinfectant uh, for the large indoor area or for any office area because it comes with a two speed more uh, setting. So with a slow speed, you can do it for small offices. For a, with a high speed, you can do it for a larger office area. And then it has a flow regulator. With the flow regulator, you can really determine based on the requirement as per the label instruction of the disinfectant. You can really yeah. de define. You can also really set the flow rate here. And then most importantly here, the, the nozzle. Nozzle is, nozzle is not fitted on the top of the body. The nozzle here is handy you see it you have a, a hose pipe here and then you have a nozzle separately so the entire machine can be really hang it can be hanging from the shoulder and then the nozzle can be used for applying to the various surfaces you don't really and uh, you don't really carry, need to carry the entire machine for uh, disinfecting a particular surface you can just move the nozzle and then you can really direct and then it has the uh, on off control also on the tip of the nozzle right so it is an effective machine, not only for disinfection. As I said in the selection criteria, this is a machine which can do three different jobs. It can do, uh, currently you have loads of disinfection services. Yes, it can do a wonderful disinfection. Once again, in the modern offices, you don't have much of a complaint these days with the uh, other pests. Like you don't have complaints nowadays with the cockroaches. You don't have complaints with the uh, rodents and other things nowadays. Mostly you have complaints with the mosquito. This is a fantastic product for the indoor mosquito management into the modern offices. So this can do a job of a disinfection and also can do a job of a, a mosquito control thing. And then you can also do a LV operation also. So low volume application can be done with this particular space. Any spray, any indoor application spray and all this, you can do it, okay? This is the machine which is manufactured from Brazil and imported by UPL and distributed by UPL, comes with a one-year warranty and it is a very simple mechanism and you don't have any cumbersome uh, maintenance process here. Right. Moving on, next one. So here um, is a uh, product called P2LV. Here, P2LV, if you look at it at the bottom, you'll see it is a machine with the zero maintenance. So you don't have any kind of a maintenance activity here if you are using a 2T oil because this is powered by a two-stroke Kawasaki engine. Two-stroke Kawasaki engine is the heart of this particular uh, machine. And then you got to add a 2T oil. If you're adding a 2T oil, complete zero maintenance on this particular machinery. And this is a champion in this particular trade. It comes with the WHO approval. You look at the WHO approval here. It is complying to the latest WHO specifications for mosquito control jobs and then we can use it for disinfection as well. Right, see this uh, equipment is able to dispense the droplets to a distance of around 60 feet horizontally. You see it at the bottom, it is 59.1 feet horizontally. And then you can also dispense that with the uh, vertical spray reach of around 39 feet. So by holding this nozzle at 45 degree angle, you cover the entire office in minutes. You don't really need to do a localized treatment. In case if you are doing it with the hand sprayer, you complete it. And when you complete with the hand sprayer, you just overcoat the entire area with this particular fogger. 
and uh, this is a fantastic ULV for fog and it has the micron range if you look at it it is from 23 micron to 27 micron and uh, a sturdy machine most of our customers are using it for five years and more and uh, this is a fantastic machine which can be used for not only for disinfection services it can be used for the four different applications currently you can use it for disinfection uh, again i said for indoor mosquito management this is a fantastic machine and it's also useful for outdoor mosquito management also the speed can be adjusted by adjusting by controlling the uh, knob there and uh, so it, it is also useful for indoor and outdoor and uh, <clears throat> it is uh, can be useful can be useful for a, a large scale larvicide application to the far off area and then you can also do any residual application if you want to do it in the far off areas so this is one of the machine which can be useful for your day to day operation not only for disinfection going forward you can use this machine for multiple operations so this machinery and then previous machinery which i was talking are fantastic products not only for the current uh, requirement of disinfection but also good for the uh, future uh, uh, regular disinfect infestation works also going forward next one this is a specialty product which has been bought uh, by uh, people who was doing large scale community level treatment and uh, there are many customers in india and there are many customers from malaysia malaysia when i gone to malaysia people used to approach me uh, showing this particular equipment so it's one of the fantastic machine which can do three different application it is can, it is useful for water uh, water management it is useful for uh, the uh, disinfestation and as well as disinfection works and it is useful for the mosquito control job also and uh, this is a leco leco is imported from usa and uh, <clears throat> here it is actively it dispenses the ulv nozzle ulv particle to around 50 uh, meter level and then with the aid of uh, drifting it can go up to around 100 meter level and this is mainly used by uh, i mean it's a vehicle mountable one and it's not a knapsack and other hand uh, carried one it's a vehicle mountable one if you are having any large scale order for uh, the roadside and the other public area yeah, quality yeah, places, you can use this particular equipment next one as i shown you this particular one is a truck mounted lava setting unit is primarily designed for lava uh, lava set application to the far off uh, area where human reach is not possible and the beauty about this particular product is it is a product that comes with a flexible tank. So you don't need to allocate a permanent vehicle for this particular one. This product comes with a flexible tank. This polyvinyl tank can be, uh, what is it? Once you uh, finish with the application, you can really just hold it and then you can, you can really unmount from the uh, vehicle. And then it is so light that if your vehicle is unable to go to the uh, interior roads, you can really unmount it with uh, two of your staff and then take it to the area where you want to really apply the uh, disinfectant. And here, this particular beauty about this particular product, it comes with the uh, hose reel, 30 meter hose reel, which can withstand pressure up to 600 PSI. Mostly what we use, find locally is they are unable to really uh, long lasting one. They only last for about a few months time. And then with the pressure, continuous pressure, they uh, lose uh, the integrity of the hose. So this particular machine is a fantastic one for a localized treatment on the roadside or the uh, common public areas. And then it is also good for the facade disinfection work and it is good for larvicide application into the uh, common areas, I mean, into the uh, mosquito uh, control jobs. Right, next one. With this, uh, I've come to the end of my presentation and bearing only one slide. Now, uh, some of you are really posting pictures that, uh, yes, we are doing a disinfection using the thermal fogger. Can, can a thermal fogger be a, a good equipment for disinfection works? Do you agree? No, they cannot do a perfect disinfection work because most of the product labels are not recommending a thermal fogger to be a equipment of choice. So uh, don't really promote your disinfection works with a thermal fogger. And the thermal fogger cannot really do a wonderful job as per your customer expectation. So with this, I'm finishing my uh, presentation. Thank you. I have not really touched upon the other equipments because it may not be wise for me to really talk about the other equipments. I've talked about our equipments here. And then uh, in case of any query, you can really uh, stay in touch with us. And then now I request uh, all the uh, speakers, right from Raja Magendran, Ujjwal Kumar, 
and uh, Dr. Pato and uh, Rajneesh and Rajesh to come up on the video mode so that we can answer all the queries one by one. Thank you for your patient listening. I believe it has taken some, almost around three hours. We would like to finish with the question and answers now. Thank you. Thank you, Sundaraj. And now we are getting on to the question and answer session. Uh, we have about uh, we have about uh, forty questions <laughs> from the speakers, but we might do only a few given the time. Uh, but before we get to the question and answer, uh, Mr. Ujwal has an announcement to make. So, Mr. Ujwal, if you can please make that announcement, then we'll get on to the question and answer. So thanks, uh, uh, Raja sir. So for participants, I would like to announce that uh, we have made a note of uh, uh, today's uh, list of participants, and we will send you email regarding participation in our next advanced module. So these uh, modules will be for three continuous days, uh, sometimes in the third week of May. So one day it will be on the biology, and one day it will be on the chemistry and equipment and one day will be on the application and customer relations so we will send you email uh, once you confirm those who confirm they will get uh, invitation for uh, the advanced module so over to you mr raja so you all will get email from our side just confirm so that we can take you in the advanced module thank you so much so now we'll go get on to the question and answer session. And uh, the first uh, question I have here is from uh, Mr. Sandeep Kumar, and it's for Dr. Pato. Dr. Pato, you're online? Yeah, I'm on. Yes. Okay. So the question is, uh, with uh, virus and bacteria, do you also find like beneficial ones, like in insect control, for example, biological control, do you get good virus and bacteria that can be used to control harmful bacteria and virus, biological control, anything in the horizon? Yeah, that's an interesting question. He's looking for biological uh, control of uh, viruses and bacteria using that agent. Well, I don't think any, anything has come to my mind or anything is uh, commercially available at the moment in the disease control industry. In, Dr. Pato? He is connecting again. Okay. You can move on to the next question. Uh, okay. Time is okay. While we wait for Dr. Pato to come, uh, the next question is from Mr. Ujwal. And the question comes from Mr. Rajan in Malaysia about uh, resistance with virus and bacteria. Is there resistance? And with the disinfectants, how can you carry out a resistance management program using this? Basically, uh, there are certain strains uh, of on macros which are resistance, but what we are talking now about the high level disinfection and medium level disinfection, which will come to the pest control industry uh, for the service application here, you need to understand that what it does as per the definition, what I've explained that high level disinfection, it, it enters, uh, it controls spores also to some extent, but not to the largest extent. So we should consider about uh, the spores part, which has got the outer covering, which doesn't allow disinfectant to enter. So as per the microbial load, when you do the risk assessment, you should address that. So development, you can refer to EPA sites, uh, and uh, there, there are certain documents like CDC documents are there. If you want to know more specific about certain strains of microbes which has got developed resistance against the disinfectants, 
there is a wide range of disinfectant wide range of microbes also so you can refer to these documents but uh, in general when we will be addressing disinfection service we need to see that criticality of the area and accordingly you have to select the molecule like hydrogen peroxide or parasitic acid or its combination or quaternary uh, uh, ammonium can be better molecule as compared to alcohols or phenols so you, you need to be very selective and if you want to know more about the chemistry you should attend to the advanced module thank you rajan thank you mr and uh, there are more questions and uh, next question is to mr prakash and actually there are two questions there from two different people but they are somewhat related uh, one question is to umar shankar asking about uh, risk how do we know about the load of test high medium low how would you say that it discusses and then jackie garcia also asked do you have any sort of monitoring devices or how do you monitor your risk okay test? okay so uma shankar you are talking about uh, microbial load so basically for that uh, uh, you have to do either swab test testing or as i said that upl is coming with some uh, good gadgets which can uh, give you the data what are the microbial loads so that answers your question and more details you will be getting in advanced course okay thank you and uh, of course any device too is still in the future yeah this question is also yeah. there about a monitoring device that will okay. be in the future i guess yeah okay. yes okay the next question i have is from mr rajnish and uh, this from a uh, mr vj uh, where can i obtain the best ppe and how do i dispose them after use uh best ppes i mean people are just in the process of uh, getting uh, some ppes whether it's from uh, xyz company but what we are focusing in this uh, presentation is the proper specification of the personal protective equipment there are not very much uh, manufacturers or suppliers of these pp of standard quality uh, or as per specification so as any suppliers or something come in uh, touch with us or we know how of a proper specification if uh, this thing comes in a big hotel we'll be letting you know about the suppliers so currently we are with the proper specification of the uh, personal protective equipment that you can judge with the label reading of the personal protective equipment so i hope uh, that i answered your question yeah i i i'll add further to that basically in india there is no strict guideline as of yet as regards to the who standard so we have to you know we are still trying to evaluate whatever pps are available and maybe in future we might be able to help you but at the moment we, we really can't be of much help as regards to from where you can source good pps there are a lot of uh, pps but we are working on that thank you okay thank you for that and uh, i have a question for mr sundar raj yeah. for the psi needed psi needed or pressure needed to deliver the unique droplet size needed for this infection for the equipment what sort of psi is needed uh, uh, the question related to any target application area or is for, for any infection for unique droplet size yes or oh, ideal um, what they mean is ideal droplet size for this infection it differs from the uh, population see if it is on the uh, top of the uh, dust surface where there is a uh, continuous touch points are there you require a larger droplet size of more than 100 micron so that it has a, a good exposure into the disinfectant but if you are focusing on the area level of application you require uh, uh, the mic micron in the range of around 30 micron more than more than 30 micron they tend to fall down faster and less than 15 micron or 20 micron they tend to evaporate in the air itself so the choice of micron should be somewhere around 15 to 30 micron 
if you are doing an area level disinfection. But if you are doing a surface level disinfection, wherein you got to really do a disinfection activity onto the workstations or the common touch points, you got to really go for the sprayer, which uh, gives uh, the droplet in the range of around 100 micron and more. Thank you. So we have lots of interesting questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. <laughs> So I'd like to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank all the speakers. First of all, Mr. Haji for opening the session today. And I know Mr. Haji has been doing a lot of work behind the scenes from what I hear. So thank you for that. And I thank all the speakers. Uh, Dr. Pato, your topic on microorganisms was a very good introduction for us. Mr. Ujwal, you simplified the chemistry of disinfectants and how we can select various disinfectants. And thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Kumar, your risk assessment was brilliant. We really saw some different insights we haven't seen before. And Mr. Rajnish with the application techniques as well. And uh, Mr. Sundaraj, the equipment overview, that was really good. And to also to remind us that we should invest in proper equipment, not only for disinfectant, but also for pest control. So that will be a dual purpose once all these urgency is over. So thank you for all of you and especially to UPL for having organized this uh, webinar. And thanks to all the participants from all around the world. Thank you very much. And with that, I hand thank, you. Back. thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you very much. Mala from Chennai. Thanks to you and thanks to all the speakers. Thank you, Mr. Rajan. Mahendran, sir. Thank you. Yeah, hope you are all good. <laughs> really yeah, happy yeah, to see you here. They're having a lot of tea. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye. Thank uh, thanks to everybody, sir. To all the eminent speakers and all the participants on behalf of our organization, Michael Basis Day. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Zolji. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sir. Uh, organizing so such uh, in advanced module knowledgeable sections okay I hope, uh, it was useful yes yes of course of course much more needed to the all parties thanks so we'll have a more detailed session in advanced module so yes. there will be like uh, less number of participants and the more faculties from uh, medical entomology side uh, medical microbiology side so we will we will cover that. Yes. So chemistry also in details. Chemistry is very important to know because otherwise even insecticides are being used as disinfectants. Yes, of course. Of course. Whole knowledge is required. Now, I think anyone wants to open their video, they can do so. Yes. Now, there's no problem. Anyone <laughs> anyone wants to speak, anyone video, you're welcome. Can chat for a few minutes, any query. You can unmute your mic, anyone who wish. Hello. Hello. For for dilution of the uh, disinfectant, <laughs> focus on that. Dilution of disinfectant. Who is this? Who is asking this question? Bharat Kundaka. Uh, see, for dilution, you know, you have to see the instruction. Like, for example, you know, you have to see the level. Uh, like sodium hypochlorite. What is the concentration? 6%. 
then how much ppm would you like 5000 ppm 10000 ppm so accordingly you have to decide the doses sitting here we cannot advise you you have to just follow the level instruction okay and two factors you have to consider one is the percentage which is shown and then what is the ppm level which you want depending upon the criticality ujwal ji hello yes sir this is yogesh yogesh yadav actually i want yeah, yeah. the simple yes, yes. syntax can you uh, there some thought? yeah residues of disinfect that are available see yogesh uh, you have to understand uh, this service this service is actually a curative treatment not okay. the preventive one so what happens if we apply in excess also so after the contact time it settles down and there is a complex is developed between macrobe and these disinfectants so this is a curative treatment we we understand that there is macrobial load we have to reduce the load once this service is over then any cross infection can happen so we should not target on using high residual content of disinfectant so in advanced module i will discuss about the complexity if you uh if you maneuver or uh, play with the doses and it settles down in heavy spraying also later it makes the complex with the microbes available in the atmosphere because potency will be down and then it will lead to different situations so i will discuss that in the advanced module in details okay sir okay thank you Rajan from Malaysia, are you there? Can you come online? No, Rajan has left. No, he is online. He is sending me WhatsApp message. I have asked him to come online. He will come. Okay. Yeah, he is coming now. why mr bramankar is on hold since very long one in lobby rajan only rajan is admitting ujwal ji yes sir ah uh, this is yogesh again can you just uh, uh, make comparison with quaternary ammonia compounds and hydrogen oxide which is more feasible and more recommended to use in urban environment ye aapko see you i will share some documents very important document these are like bible in case of dis disinfectants so you go deeper into that because you need to invest time so there are different situation different microbial species and load depending on that we have to decide about the program so even hydrogen peroxide and quaternary ammonium and this parasitic acid they are very good molecules in order to have the effect because broad spectrum is there so i will share yogesh that document with you just go through it and we can have one to one chat on that okay sir thanks a lot thanks a lot mosquito and flies can spread this wax mosquito and fly Right. Can't see. See, uh, <clears throat> this topic is not at all about the insect pests. This is about microbes. So, uh, you should treat not uh, disinfectant, not as insecticide. It is in the drug. So you have to come to the medical microbiology part. So first step has to happen that from entomology. urban entomology you have to shift to medical microbiology then only you will understand this chapter better so uh, there is a thin line but uh, most of these insecticides will not act as uh, biocides so we call this group as biocides so they will not act as biocides for disinfectants so we have to totally do away with the with our knowledge or expertise in the domain of pest control operation where target is insect pests 
so here your target is macro organism so it comes under under medical microbiology and the molecule comes under pharmacology so it's it, it is treated as drugs so totally a new chapter is opening up and we need to develop a knowledge bank and uh, we should really educate each other that whosoever is not following self follow so this is a matter of evolving the process we need to evolve the process so that's why we are taking uh, initiative at least to give basic information to the industry so that at least a uh, very a violation of uh, the complete principles or theory is not there while you people conduct the business business opportunity is tremendous this is going to last at least peak will be for next 3 years and then this will stabilize this particular space so let us join hands and work together this can take us to all together and different revenue zone i always talk about revenue in my meetings so revenue is important but to get the revenue and get the confidence of customer we need to deliver proper service that is important that is what is the aim of this training and the in advanced module we will always focus on the practical application part Visual sir. Hi. Visual sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can we can we use the small fog machines that we use in the cars to inside the offices or inside the houses? Yes, Sundar has explained you about the nebulizers. No, I think uh, uh, you should refer to that his presentation because he has explained you about uh, these small equipments which can be used. and in case of offices you need to see uh, two aspects one is uh, the microbes which are there on the surfaces another is aerial one so fine droplets can be used uh, using nebulizers and on walls uh, even fine uh, spraying can also be done what do you think rajan yeah that's in right case, in case of office scenario so rajan is coming up with the some simple documents guideline for different situations what pest control operator is going to face like one will be office scenario another will be high net net worth individual houses because now your business in small apartments and small houses is going to be down they will they will would not like uh, the any other person to visit their house but uh, those who are having big bungalows and big houses they will look for this service so six seven scenarios he is creating and in a very one pager uh, pictorial graphics he will explain that what exactly you have to do in such cases what is more effective the misting or the fogging no 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 fogging also misting so depending upon the contact time if contact time needs to be more you should go for misting and if contact time of that particular disinfectant is less then we can go for fine cold fogging also you will be uh, misters also can be uh, used so fine droplets for lesser contact time of the disinfectant and uh, big droplet uh, shall be released for those uh, compounds which has got uh, bigger contact time so depending upon the contact time you have to choose your strategy thank you I think now we are almost done. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, guys, uh, we will be in touch, and uh, uh, you yes, can. Uh, I will just uh, type my email ID and number. Yes, sir. So, so that you can get in touch with me. Thanks a lot. Sir.
and my number is this. If anyone sends mail on this ID also, this comes to me only. Yes, sir. Thanks. So please let's be in touch over email. So thank you all. Uh, if uh, you don't have any questions, so we'll just close the session. Thanks for your participation. We look forward uh, for your participation in advanced module. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye.